Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is December 19th, 2023, and today we are here to discuss uh, the sentencing of Mormon fraudster Trevor Milton. Um, for those of you who don't know, Trevor Milton was hyped to be or put himself out to be sort of the Elon Musk of the large 18 wheeler kind of truck industry. He's he's a Mormon. He was, you know, born and raised in Utah and somehow he rose to the level of uh of nat global industry convincing GM to partner with him, convincing the world that he had figured out how to engineer hydrogen based uh, I don't know electric trucks that um were going to transform the industry. And a super big fraudster fooled the world. At some point, his company was worth, I don't know, one to $2 billion. No, uh, 60. 60, bi 60 billion, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, it was all like Elizabeth Holmes. It was all freaking vaporware. And the weirdest thing of all is that most of you have no idea um, that this ever happened. Those of you who live in Utah, those of you who are Mormon, have probably never heard of of, of uh, Trevor Milton or of Nicola, but I can tell you CNBC certainly has heard of heard of him. And so uh, I am so fortunate to have back on Mormon Stories, Mark Pugsley. Mark's been on Mormon Stories several times before. I think of him as Utah's fraud uh, expert and watchdog. Hey, Mark, thanks hey, for John. coming back. Thanks. It's so good to have you. Yeah. So I, I heard about this story first on like a Wall Street Journal podcast. So this is literally international news. Um, and you're kind of you were you were on that podcast. Can you just tell people really quickly an intro to who you are, what that podcast was, <laughs> how big this story is, and then we'll jump right in. Wow. Okay. So the podcast you're referring to, I think last time I was here, we were talking about the church's settlement with the SEC. So I think I mentioned it there, but it's called Bad Bets, B-A-D-B-E-T-S by the Wall Street Journal. And we were season two. And uh, there's a whole history to how that came about. It was um, uh, interesting. You know, one of the things that I do in my legal practice, John, is I represent whistleblowers. And that's um, usually we've come here, I, the last two times I came here to talk about David Nelson, who is a good friend, but not a client. Um, today, we're going to talk about some folks who are my clients. And um, I just want to say from the beginning, and I might reiterate this at some point, that I have permission to talk about this story. Uh, most people come to me are anonymous, uh, stay anonymous. I do, I do not talk about their stories. But in this case, these clients ultimately decided to go public with their story, and that's why I'm able to sit here and talk about our conversations to some extent. I'll try to be careful, but um, I have been given permission by these clients to talk about this story and to share our experience, our collective experience about what happened in the Nicola story. Um, I, one other just quick disclaimer, John, is that I'm my memory as I've gotten older, uh, I, I'm practicing 30 years now, believe it or not, it makes me feel very old, but I, uh, my memory is not perfect. Uh, this all, most of the stuff we're going to talk about began happening in 2016. The time that I got involved was 2020. So it's been a little bit of time that we've been, um, dealing with this story and I'll try to, I've, I've tried to reread some of the materials to remind myself of the, of the deadlines and the dates and things, but um, it's not perfect. In terms of my legal practice, um, I've been uh, practicing in, in Salt Lake City for a long time. I was with a large law firm for a number of years doing securities law, uh, securities litigation. So when I um, graduated from law school, um, the law firm I was with was in Los Angeles. Then I moved back to Utah where I grew up. And I began uh, doing all sorts of different securities litigation related practices. And so... It just because Utah has a fraud problem, I kept getting these calls and I would get calls from just regular people saying, hey, I invested with, you know, this guy who I kind of knew he was in my ward typically and I can't get my money out and he's not returning my phone calls and I need your help. And uh, at first I was not that interested in those cases. And then I began to take on those cases to try to help people get their money out of these in many cases, Ponzi schemes, or sometimes it was just like a loan they'd given to some guy. It was almost always 
within the LDS community. And there's a word for that called um, uh, affinity fraud. Affinity fraud is is the type of uh, fraud where they have a connection with someone through church, typically. And Utah has the highest incident of that in the world, probably. I don't know. Certainly in the country, we have the highest per capita incidence of uh, of um, uh, Ponzi schemes. And there's that's one of the first, I guess it's the first podcast I did with you was years ago talking about that problem. And we can talk about it today. I mean, one of the things that's interesting to talk about is why, why, what is going on here? Is there something in the water? Why are guys like Trevor Milton or Tim Ballard, or, you know, we can name a bunch of them. What is going on? Why are these people proliferating in this state? And you don't really see this other places. So there's a lot to talk about in terms of that. So through my practice, Eventually, uh, after um, the Bernie Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme, the SEC implemented a program called the SEC Whistleblower Program. And it was about 11 years ago um, when they implemented that program, where if you bring information about fraud to the SEC and they take action, shut down a fraud scheme and impose fines and penalties, then they'll pay you an award if it's if they collect more than a million dollars. And so... I don't know. I just kind of started doing it on the side. People would call me and I'd say, well, I don't know if we can really sue that person, but I, I can file a whistleblower case. So I did. And I started filing them and I filed quite a few over the years. And then um, through this Nicola case, um, I represented some whistleblowers uh, and uh, we uh, did the case we're going to talk about today. And then uh, they did a podcast about it. The Wall Street Journal thought it was interesting enough story to do a podcast about. Uh, there's actually a book being written about it. And we are in discussions potentially to do a, a docu-series on Netflix. We'll see if it ever comes about. But it's kind of a fun story. Uh, I like to talk about it. It's, it's, it's a crazy, it's got a lot of crazy stuff that happened in the interim and we can, we can chat about that. Yeah. And if I can just add as teasers, there isn't just Utah Mormon fraud of global scale. Uh, there's also allegations of sexual abuse or harassment against Trevor Milton, both by, I don't know, at least one coworker and at least one family member, yeah, as I understand his it. Cousin. Yeah. I've been in touch with some people who have made allegations and then there's at least one death by suicide associated yep. with somebody who tried to turn uh, Trevor Milton in. And if Sean Reyes weren't beat up enough on Mormon Stories podcast <laughs> because of his involvement with Tim Ballard and Operation Underground Railroad and all the lawsuits, there's, you know, we're even going to be talking about an apparent, I don't know, Sean Reyes, Utah Attorney General cover up protecting Trevor Milton at the expense of both. Uh, you know, uh, alleged victims and one alleged whistleblower who died by suicide. So this is a dark, deep story that just, that, that implicates again, the same group, whether it's Tim Ballard or Sean Reyes or uh, Trevor Milton, there's just these, this group of bros, Mormon, powerful Mormon bros. Yep involved in a lot of shady stuff. Yep, and there are others out there, and uh, <laughs> yes. uh, there will be more stories to talk about down the road. I Why think, are we laughing? I don't know. It's just like, it's it's crazy because you asked me the other day, you were texting me and you said, is there a, is there a, a, a Sean Reyes aspect to this story? And I said, yes, <laughs> yes, there is. I, it's a new rule. He's going to make an appearance in all future Mormon Stories uh, podcasts. He'll be the new Mormon Stories mascot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sean Reyes. <laughs> Who happens to be a friend of mine, I should say, just for, for clarity. I know Sean really well. Oh, wow. Yeah. A friend of yours. Yeah. After today? And former client. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Um, I don't know about <laughs> after today. <laughs> let's... I haven't publicly criticized him, so but we can chat. So let's begin by just showing, I mean, I guess, so I'll just have to say, a lot of people wanted me to tell the story, and a lot of people had personal experiences mm. with Trevor Milton. Okay. But they were terrified that he would sue them if they told the truth. Yeah. What is it about today that made maybe you and others more comfortable to talk about the story? <laughs> well, he was, uh, yesterday, um, I was uh, glued to Twitter because I wasn't able to fly out to New York for the sentencing, but he was sentenced to four years in prison. Um, and a million dollar fine. And then we believe there will also be additional penalties 
uh, in terms of restitution to investors. Uh, the number the court accepted was $660 million in restitution. We will see if that's what's ultimately imposed in terms of a penalty. The other thing is that, and we can talk more about it, but the SEC hasn't even taken action against him yet. They've been holding back till the criminal case finishes. Mm, okay. And we believe that the SEC is going to implement um, its own, or start up its own case now, which has kind of been on hold. Okay. So he's got lots of lots of stuff coming at him. And I think now people maybe feel freer to talk because it, he's been sentenced. Is he on bail or is yeah. he in prison? He's not, he was not incarcerated. Uh, the, he's appealing it. And the judge said that he could stay out uh, during the appeal, uh, which could be years. So that's unfortunate. Um, and I can tell you about my view on the, the sentence, but I attended the trial part of it. So mm. I can talk a little bit about that. So I've okay. been involved in this for about three years now. All right, well, let's go ahead and roll the clip and just show kind of the headlines as of yesterday from one from CNBC. Details still, what can you tell us? Kelly, uh, Trevor Milton has been sentenced to four years in prison for his role in fraud committed at Nikola when he was the CEO. Two counts of wire fraud, one count of securities fraud. The prosecutors were looking for 11 years in prison. The defense attorneys were arguing that Trevor Milton should be given probation, in part to care for his wife who has been ill. The judge ultimately decided Trevor Milton, the founder and former CEO of Nikola, will be spending the next four years, at least that's the sentence, four years in prison for fraud. Kelly, back to you. Phil, does, is this a surprising sentence? Uh, because it's, you know, to have, to see someone going and, and now having to spend a significant jail time really tells you about the seriousness of what they said took place here. Well, these were serious crimes. I mean, if you were an investor and you bought into what Trevor Milton was selling uh, when he was the CEO in the summer of 2020, you could make an argument. You could say, hey, look, you know, uh, this caused me a lot of financial harm. And what the judge ultimately had to decide was, did that harm that was caused by Trevor Milton uh, making the claims that he made, the wire fraud claims, as well as the security fraud, was that worth a decade in prison or was it worth much less? And ultimately, he decided four years was the appropriate term. Also, keep in mind that in arbitration two months ago, uh, Trevor Milton was determined that he will have to pay $165 million back to Nikola. Wow. And just for one more thing to keep in mind, Kelly, he still owns 52 million shares of Nikola. Wow. So I, it, we're waiting to get some details from the courtroom in terms of what he will have to give up financially in addition to this sentence of four years. All right, Phil, thank you for bringing that to us. I mean, 52 million shares of Nikola, I, I have to think that these these shares are worthless, but am I wrong? No, it's trading. Uh, I haven't checked it in the last few days, but it's been trading around a dollar. So, okay. but, but he, like, like he just said, he got hit with a $160 million arbitration uh, award against him between the company. Cause the company basically sued him for all these problems. The company has already settled with the sec for 125 million. Can he pay, you know, the company back? Can he pay investors back? Can he pay the SEC fines that haven't even been assessed yet? I mean, it'll, it remains to be seen, but I'm not holding my breath. Well, let's let's do the Mormon story now. So obviously, for, for people to wonder why we're talking about this, dude's from St. George. Yes. Dude's Mormon. He's been faithful Mormon as far as we know for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So this is a Mormon story. And let's just jump to... What are, what 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 is worth talking about about the beginnings of of Trevor Milton? I'll, I'll just I'll just give you a quick uh, spoiler alert. Is that at some point when he bought a uh, uh, twenty? Let's see. I think it's a thirty-two million dollar ranch up in uh, Camas or Oakley, or I think it was in Oakley, the largest uh, purchase of real estate in U.S. history, uh, Utah history, excuse yeah. me, at the time. Right. Is he took. Uh, people on a tour and he paused at the wine cellar, which was full of wine and said, now this is my wife. My wife drinks wine, but of course I would never drink this wine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> because we really were worried. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the guy I've seen him in person, but I've never met him. So I, I'll just tell you what I know from the podcast and research others have done, which is he grew up um, in small towns in Utah, not even in St. George. He grew up in an even smaller town than that. Um, his, his, uh, he grew up very 
uh, poor, I believe. He was someone who was always uh, very um, ambitious. And he went on a mission to Brazil. He came back and did believe it or not, summer sales, and we can talk about, you know. <laughs> that was, a, for those who are Mormon, that was a bit of a ir ironic Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I have a really strong view of, of summer sales, and um, I've said You've just before. offended half my male audience. Yeah, I just... don't, I, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine, get a real job. That's all I'll say, but but oh, I, I brought, I brought uh, uh, my other, some other clients and I, this is public, uh, is, we caused a Vivint smart home to be um, fined uh, $23 million or so for unethical sales practices. So I have strong views about summer sales. And let me tell you why. Um, Trevor Milton is a perfect example. He comes home, naive kid. He actually tried to buy alarm system. So he was kind of selling them himself. It wasn't, this was, I think, maybe even before Vivint was a, a thing, but he, what happens is these kids come home and they have thick skins and they're good at sales. Cause you know, if you can sell religion, you can sell anything. And so there you get snapped up by Vivint and the solar companies and the, um, the, uh, pest control companies. And they take these good, nice Mormon missionaries. It's alarm systems, pest control and solar and solar, right? Yeah. All, always. No, no offense, no shade. You know, but. No, I, I'll shade all day long. I think it's terrible because what's happening is they're taking these nice kids who are ethical, I'm sure, good people, and they put them out and they train them to engage in often, not always, but often unethical sales practices. And they, It's worth mentioning that they, they like them. Because they have their experience as yes. Mormon missionaries. Yeah. That's part of the Mormon yeah. angle, right? And, and, and there may be a, a connection between the, the by what we were just talking about. Why is there so many of these, why are there so many of these people like this who are kind of these alpha provo bros, flat brim hats with whatever, <laughs> going around selling stupid things that people are buying and driving Lamborghinis. I mean, this is a thing in Utah and it's, it's either crypto now, there's all sorts of other groups out there that are just selling stuff. And that's because you take these return missionaries and they are good at selling stuff. But I have no problem with that. I have no problem with the, the industry of sales generally, but what I have a problem with is taking good uh, young return missionaries and in really teaching them, training them to be unethical in the way they do it. And, you know, um, I, I've heard you tell long ago the story about your mission where there were baptisms that were probably not, people didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And there is a bit of an ethos at times. I served an LDS mission, um, so I can speak from authority at some level that you you get the deal done because the end always justifies the means, right? Whatever you can say, as long as you get them in the water and you you know can put it on your stats, that is okay. And that I think is the problem is if you take that into sales, and then if you take that same ethos, that same level of 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 ethic into a publicly traded company where the SEC is monitoring what you say, where investors are making decisions based on what you say, it's super problematic. And anyway, I just, I just, I, I'm, I'm fine. You, you can all have your jobs, whatever your jobs are, but just please be honest and ethical in the way that you sell things because people need to know what they're buying. And when you're putting other people's names on credit applications and doing some of the unethical stuff that Vivian was doing, I think that's problematic. And I think that leads to bigger problems in our in our community here in Salt Lake City, in, okay. in, in Utah, I should say. All right. Well, I definitely respect your point of view and your perspective. So now, <laughs> now that I've just lost, day long, now I've lost half my donors. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> and they can, you know, blow me up. I don't care, but I am happy to say that I'm, uh, I, I just uh, have encouraged all my sons not to do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, okay, that's that that's fair. All right, so he serves a mission in Brazil, in Brazil, uh -huh. and then what? Then he comes home back to St. George and uh, he begins, he actually buys, uh, I think he went to UVU, uh, but he only, in fact, we, I believe he dropped out of high school and then he went to UVU and only went for one semester. And he always says, you know, I dropped out kind of like. You know, I'm like Mark Zuckerberg or I'm like Elon Musk dropping out of college, but it was UVU guys. It wasn't Stanford and it wasn't Harvard. But the point is uh, that came out in the trial was that he was actually kicked out of UVU for cheating. So that's I don't have personal knowledge of that. That's what came out in the in the trial. So he's a guy that 
I guess, has been ethically challenged for a long time. Um, the He uh, went into the alarm company. He bought an alarm company in St. George, tried to get that to work, didn't really get it to work. Then he met a guy who's going to come up because he's one of my clients, and he taught him how to convert trucks into um, – uh, taught him how to convert trucks into basically hybrid uh, diesel running off of batteries. And they started this kind of hybrid thing, conversion company. Um, that led to uh, Trevor kind of trying to take that to the next level. He uh, tried to work deals with fairly big companies uh, to uh, have them buy the technology that he claimed had abilities that it did not. And then ultimately, um, it led to him creating the company Nikola, which was intended to be a company that made trucks that were electric, essentially, or but were hybrid. Let me just, can I just say a couple things about Please. this? I'll try to be fast. Please, we're, no, we're, no. Maybe people don't care. But uh, uh, if, you, if you have a Tesla, um, uh, you know that they're extra challenges having a battery powered car. One of them is recharging. Um, my wife drives a Tesla and we, other day we went up to Jackson Hole and we had to spend a half an hour in um, Evanston, Wyoming, recharging the thing so we could get up to Jackson. So that's a, a challenge, right? It's kind of a pain in the butt. Then take that and try to make it into a semi truck that's carrying, you know, tons and tons of, of cargo. And that's what Trevor Milton was trying to do. But there's some technological problems with that. One of them is batteries are extremely heavy and these things would weigh many tons, which makes it even harder. And then you'd have to put so many batteries in a truck like that that you'd have to pull, you'd have to take two hours every few hundred miles. You have to stop for two hours to charge all those batteries because they it takes time to charge that many big batteries. So, um, you know, the idea of having a Tesla of semi-trucks is a great one, but the the technology just is not there. And so what Trevor Milton began doing was saying, I'm going to do a hybrid type technology in, involving compressed natural gas, CNG. So it's like you fill it up with compressed natural gas and that runs a generator kind of like an actual hybrid. It was essentially a hybrid and that powers the batteries and that can go and go and go. Um, that also... Because uh, if he didn't do that, I'm imagining Elon Musk would say, "Dude, the the physics aren't there yet. The physics aren't there. You're 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 fooling people." Right? Yeah, and Elon Musk uh, is developed. I mean, there's there's pictures out there of a Tesla semi truck. I mean, it's a trillion dollar industry, the semi truck industry, right? So, people have been trying to crack that, just like the automobile, and. Uh, Tesla has been trying to do it and Trevor Milton said he was trying to do it. And one of the reasons he has his, com his company got so successful as we'll talk about is because he was lying to people about overcoming these huge technological challenges that yeah. he took on. Yeah. Okay. So a trail of fraud, but somehow he always jumps to a better position after each fraud. Is that right? Yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know how much you want to get into the history, but but yeah, that's essentially what happens. And, and along the way, he leaves a lot of people really angry. And he left a wake of partners and investors uh, that were all really angry with him for, for years because he would kind of develop something and then he would take the technology and move it to another company. And then, uh, then he would not, you know, then all the people are left with an empty shell of a company and the technology is gone. Um, one of them, one of the people that uh, invested in or that helped him start a company called Dehybrid uh, was supposed to be a, uh, essentially a, a truck conversion company. And he uh, had a bunch of investors, people that were putting in 20,000, 30,000, in most cases, their entire life savings. And then he basically started another company. This is just one example called uh, Dehybrid Systems, and, <laughs> and which is very similarly named, and then moved a lot of the technology into the new company and left the old company uh, pretty much empty. And probably investors and, investors. and stakeholders yeah. and yeah. owners. He's cutting started, people out of yeah. any potential profit, right? And they're litigating, you know, I'm not making this up. He uh, dehybrid 
had investors who then sued them. Uh, Swift, uh, which is a big trucking company, entered into this big contract with him and later sued him like really quickly after that. And then they alleged in their complaint, and this is not personal knowledge to me, but they alleged that he was taking their investment that was supposed to be developing the technology and, you know, buying boats and stuff. Um, there's if the Bad Bets interviews Mike, who's one of my clients, who has helped him develop this company, Dehybrid, and he was hardly ever getting paid. And he would, and then Trevor kept bringing in, you know, these bigger boats, and he was always living this lifestyle that was way ahead of where his financial situation was, and investors were paying for that. Um, he claimed to uh, start a company, I think it was called U-Pillar, that was going to be bigger than Amazon and that it was going to be a kind of an online marketplace and it never went anywhere. So he was telling people that he would double their money if they invested with him. They did in many cases, trusting that he was who he said he was and that the technology was what he said it would do. And then they ended up losing their money, every single one of them. Some of them he paid back if they were loud enough, but for the most part, they got screwed. Um, so he, he, this is a classic in this U-Pillar company. He claimed that he had invented the shopping cart, the online shopping cart where you put your stuff in it. <laughs> what the, yeah, yeah. That's like Al Gore inventing the internet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, the, the report that we're going to talk about basically said that that had been invested, invented 15 years prior. <laughs> so he, his company didn't even exist. He was like in junior exactly, high when, exactly. when that was invented, but he claimed everyone that he had more hits than Amazon on his website, which was not true. No, no way. People, people were investing with him based on these kind of crazy assertions. So it's, it's like the bigger the lie, the more people believe it sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, sometimes. And you'll see that pattern here uh, in everything is exaggerated. Like if the Swift deal, I think was a $16 million deal, but he kept telling everyone it was a $20 million deal. And then the next deal he did, he sold it uh, to another um, company. And he claimed that this Swift contract uh, in later was a 20 to 50, 250 to 300 million dollar contract and it was only 16. so his exaggerations to go to your point john his exaggerations kept getting more and more outrageous um and the problem is you know he's a college dropout a high school dropout and he all of a sudden is able to talk his way into running a a, a multi-billion dollar trucking company. I mean, it's crazy. And it's so weird that, that we just see this pattern of people being able to hop, I'm, I'm repeating myself, hop from fraud to fraud to fraud, leaving fraud and, and disenchanted partners and investors victims. in their wake, victims nah, in their yeah, wake. Yeah. But then the next the next fraud makes him wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Uh, how, do, how does it not... How do they not stop at the first fraud? You well, know what I mean? as he gets wealthier, he has more ability to hire good lawyers to sue them. If mm. they say anything about him, he started getting people to sign non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. So he was, and he began being much more aggressive about making sure people didn't talk. Um, if people talk too much to the victims, then he would pay him some money and make them go away. And of course, make them sign releases that said they couldn't talk about it. I, that may sound familiar. So well, this, what do you mean? Familiar how? Just like the LDS church does oh, oh, with okay. its sex right. abuse cases, right, right, right? Right, right? If you pay people enough money, then they won't talk. And so when you, as you get more wealthy, you have increasing ability to manage litigation and hire good lawyers to, to scare people. That's yeah. the reality. Okay. All right. So that's kind of his background. Is there anything else worth mentioning before we talk about his hopping to Nicola? Um, yeah, we'll we'll talk about the sentencing and the the all the stuff later about what happened, but a lot of the mission stuff actually comes into play in his sentencing, surprisingly. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> the Mormon mission stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> and his tithing. He uses that to claim how charitable he was. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, this this can't get any better. Okay, or worse. So what what's next? So um, you know, and I <sighs> I would encourage people to listen to the Bad Bets podcast because it it interviews a lot of these victims and a lot of them tell the story of how he came to them. I can't really do it justice, John. I don't have all these audios ready to go, but these people talked in great detail about what he told them and why he um, why they invested, uh, what, what was it about Trevor that was compelling to them? And it's, it's very interesting to hear because he, a lot of the stuff that he was telling them are exactly the kind of things that you would kind of expect. Um, so he, he begins 
to move up and he moves after Swift and he uh, got into a big dispute. Then he began um, uh, moving to build a company called uh, Nikola. And Nikola was not initially called that. It was, I think it was called Blue Gen Systems or something beforehand, but eventually he took uh, the name Nikola. And if many people may not know the significance of that name, but um, the the stock play, the investment play that Trevor began working into was, you know, we're the next Tesla. At that point, Tesla was extremely successful. Um, and people who were uh, not invested were kicking themselves because it was worth like $400 billion. And they were saying, geez, I wish I would have trusted this Elon Musk guy and invested in that company sooner, but they didn't. So they're thinking, okay, what's the next Tesla? So Trevor changed the name of, of his company to, um, uh, to Nikola. And the person that invented electricity, maybe not invented, but the, the scientist in Italy who was one of the inventors of electricity was Nikola Tesla. So Tesla was already taken, so he chose the guy's first name and named his company Nikola, and that was not by accident, for sure. Uh, he was trying to position this company as the next Tesla only for trucks. But, you know, it's a different, it's a whole different deal. Um, he had to, um, uh, you know, figure out a lot of highly technical uh, challenges in order to get these trucks to work. And so what happened is he began to um, use uh, uh, lies and uh, exaggerations to uh, tell people that he had uh, accomplished things that he had not accomplished. And so he began developing this truck. Um, he got lots of investors. He got some, in, including... Uh, some big Wall Street investors to come in, and he began actually building a truck. The problem is he didn't have the technological expertise to do it. And if you look at his um, people, he was basically outsourcing and then putting off-the-shelf products together into a truck and then telling people that it was all proprietary technology, which it was not. Um, when you when you buy a, an inverter, which is one of the key aspects of uh, these trucks, these electric um, engines, they have an inverter that changes electricity into power, and they put one over each wheel in most cases. And he, in one time, for instance, he showed a copy of the inverters that he claimed were being developed in-house with all of his in-house experts, when in reality he had taken some tape to cover up the label uh, showing what the actual battery, the inverter was bought off the shelf. It was something that anyone could buy. But he claimed in these videos very brazenly that this was developed in-house, so that was just not true. That's just one example of a lot of different examples where people, where he was basically saying that they had the technological expertise in-house that they did not have uh, to accomplish some of these technological challenges, which were huge. I mean, every scientist in the world was trying to accomplish these kind of things and figure out how to make this, to tap into this trillion dollar trucking industry and no one could do it. And yet Trevor kept coming out and saying that he had done it. And it's, it's hard to get into all the details on this because there's so many uh, uh, examples. And one of the things that we used in the report that we, my clients put together was um, his social media posts. So he did a lot of podcast interviews. He did, did a lot of um, interviews with uh, um, trucking industry reporters. He did a lot of, he put a lot of videos out on Instagram. And um, all of this was then later used by the Department of Justice as evidence of how he was saying that he had accomplished things that he really had not accomplished. So one of the first ones that he did was he, you know, had a truck that was built and he hired a guy named Paul Lackey out of uh, Portland, Oregon, who was an electronic engineer, uh, electric engineer who specialized in um, electric vehicles and his company to come out and help them kind of put together this truck. And so these guys, uh, Trevor went out and sweet talked to him and said, hey, you guys are so great. I just want you to. Uh, I'm going to probably buy your company, but I want your expertise to help us put on this this big reveal of our truck. So he knew that investors needed something more than just promises. They needed to actually see it working. 
So he hired Paul and his partner to come out and put together this truck and put together all the things. The problem was uh, that the truck itself w required a huge amount of technology that they actually didn't have. And so they uh, came out before this big reveal of the what's called the Nikola One, um, and they were kind of shocked when the pieces that they had shipped uh, were still on the warehouse two weeks before this big reveal. And they were still just sitting on the pallet that, that they had sent them on. So nothing had been done. And Trevor was so busy hyping the company that he was not busy running the company. <laughs> and he really didn't have in-house technological expertise that was up to this task of of take, making this truck a reality, uh, this hybrid, you know, a uh, natural gas hybrid truck that they were claiming they were going to be able to make. So they... Uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a quick sure. question. Yeah. So obviously this is reminding me of Elizabeth Holmes. Yes. And, you know, for those of you who don't know who she is, she was like a Silicon Valley darling who went to Stanford and, you know, started claiming that she could develop a blood testing device that Walgreens ended up yeah. uh, licensing or, or, you know, using or whatever. That, that she could could conduct multiple blood tests with one device mm -hmm. and it was all vaporware right but but you know she like Trevor starts this company hires all these engineers is hyping it all over the world certainly she's knowing the whole time that they don't she doesn't have the technology yeah. that she's hyping but but for me there's always this question of did she know that she, never was going to have anything and just figured she could pull off a fraud long enough to then take a bunch of money out of it at the end of the at the end of the deal or was it more like this leap of faith where she felt like well i okay i'm deceiving people now but if i get enough good talent in here we'll develop the stuff so that once the rubber actually meets the road mm. Um, we have something real. Like, do you have a sense at this point in the story where Trevor is in, in his mind, in his own mind? I, I don't. And I, I really? certainly, yeah, I mean, I, I think, well, there is this phrase in, in technology, which is fake it till you make it. Right. right. And I think that's what both of them were doing. They were like, well, if we can just get out there and tell people, then we'll just, it'll eventually, we'll get enough money that we can put this whole thing together. The problem is that the, in both cases, I think, and they are, have often been compared, the Theranos story and the Nikola story are similar in a lot of ways, unsimilar in the sense that um, her company never went public. Elizabeth Holmes did not have a public company when she was arrested. Uh, Trevor did. Um, she got 11 years in prison, just as an aside, and he yeah. got four. What is, so what is up with what that? What is up with that? I don't know. Different <laughs> judge, different, they were in different states, you know. It's just judges have the ability. In fact, the Department of Justice asked for the exact same sentence for Trevor that she got, 11 years. That was their recommendation, and the judge didn't take it. Mm. So, unfortunately. But the, the stories are very similar, and, uh, you know, Elizabeth Holmes is someone who is a very interesting character. What's the what's the story? There's the movie about her, and I forget what the it's called. Inventor, the Inventor? Or the, I'll have to look it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. was quite good. And there was a, a documentary that was done on Theranos that was quite good. And um, this this kind of came soon after that. So our case was has always been compared to the Theranos story. Um, so, okay, the, there's the dropout and the inventor okay, okay. out for blood in Silicon Valley. Yeah. One's a dramatization, I think, and one's maybe a documentary. Right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. I'll have Julie include those in yeah, the show. And, and yeah. they're both well well worth watching. I've seen them both. And um, the documentary is stunning because it really shows kind of how brave the, the whistleblowers were. And in our case, similarly, the whistleblowers, and we'll get to that in a minute, were also extremely fearful of retaliation, legal action, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so it was a, it was really a scary time for all of us. So you don't know whether he, you don't know whether he was acting with faith or just knew I, that I would this have no is way all going to blow. That. Yeah. No, okay. I, okay. But but I do know that he he and we'll get to this. But so he didn't hire the right people. I mean, what what he was trying to do 
was one of the most sophisticated and challenging yeah. technological challenges known to man. Stuff and, Elon Musk couldn't do. Correct, right? correct. Yeah. And, and at one point in this story, as he's hyping this technology and hyping his trucks, he claims that he has doubled the life of batteries. Well, well, batteries are the name of the game in this business, right? And this is something, all the top technology, it's a, it's a, it's a huge potential revenue source of for any company that can do this, which is to make batteries more efficient. So instead of recharging your Tesla every 300 miles, you can take it 600 miles. I mean, that's a huge issue for anyone that has a Tesla is how, how often you have to charge the damn thing, right? And so this, and when it came to trucks, that was even more uh, of a technological challenge. So he claimed at one point before the company went public that he had solved this problem and that he had found that they had technology that they developed that was going to be uh it was going to solve all the problems with with batteries and that they were going to double that and so that was something that was um hu hugely important in terms of how investors saw this company they saw this company as having the best uh, uh engineers in the world working on the hardest problems and solving them because trevor keep coming out kept coming out and saying we've solved this problem and uh, when he when he had not. Okay. Okay. What happens next? We've got some clips, but le, le, let me know when to play some well, of the clips. Well, so so really, in 2016, um, I think people began to ask in the industry, you know, hey, dude, are you gonna? The company had not gone public yet, which is a big deal, by the way, because public companies have SEC oversight and non-public companies less so. So the company had not gone public, but he came out and said you know, realized that he needed to show a truck that could work because people were doubting his ability. And so he How had- How much do you think he had raised by this point? Any idea? I, I don't remember. Okay, okay. I don't remember, but it was quite a bit. And he had Tens had an millions, investments. Maybe? Oh yeah, yeah. And he had an, he had some big investments, especially uh, from a company called Worthington, which is a big, a big uh, like a trucking company, I think of some sort. And then he had other partnerships that he'd been developed. He was really good. He was very good at selling, right? That's what he was good at. <laughs> Not much good at it. Not much else, engineer. but he was really good at that. <laughs> Not quite an engineer. Yeah, no. And so, <laughs> so he had a, uh, he he want he knew that he had to take it to the next level. So he took his uh, he hired my client Paul, hired this other company, and had some other people. And he got this truck design off of some German website that they bought <laughs> it. And then he had an actual fiberglass thing made, and then um, put it out there for the press to see. And this was really a big day for Nikola before it was preparing to go public. They knew they needed to get ready to go public. That's where the real money is. And so he knew he had to really make a splash with this truck and show people that that he wasn't just full of it, that he was actually making things that work. And so I think you've got video of this big reveal happened in Salt Lake City, Utah, and it happened um, in, you know, not far from actually where I work. And uh, they, you know, got to, let's see, what's the date of that, John? I think it's um, in 2016. Okay, yeah, so it's in 2016. He, he takes some of the parts and puts them together on top of a chassis. There were no batteries in it. There were no engine motors in it. There was no compressed natural gas in it. It was pretty much uh, uh, not, not operable. And uh, what, what happened is he got some people together. He hyped it online. He hyped it on Twitter. He got Governor Herbert to show up, and then he made this big reveal. But he said some things that became really crucial in his criminal trial, and, and you'll hear them, I think, if you if you can play that. Okay. Yeah, and and really quickly, um, I'm going to play it, and the way I'm going to play it, I, I hope this works is in a way where we can kind of make comments on it as <laughs> as it's playing. Okay, is that all right? Sure. So uh, I'll I'll start it running now. It's basically this is on the, the by the way this is on like the Wayback Machine, um, and it's got this stage. For those who are just listening, it's got this stage with this huge. Um, let me make sure the audio is working. It's got this stage with this huge. Uh, I don't know cloth over the truck. You can see it full of a bunch of people, and uh, I'm hoping that we can hear. <laughs> Okay, so here's the countdown now, and uh, you see all these people in a room. A lot of people. Where, yeah. where is this? This is in Salt Lake City, down at a, at a, I don't know exactly the address, but it's downtown. Okay, and, and again, there's like a big truck on stage with a big sheet over it. 
And, no. uh, and listen, listen to what what he says about everything the kind of starts okay. when you're young and you have a lot of paths in life you can take. But this was my path to transform how trucking works, everything about it from the ground up. America was built on the backs of diesels. It's really incredible. I love the history of diesels. It was developed primarily because it was more efficient and stronger than the alternatives at the time. And now we face the same problems. How do we build something that's stronger, more efficient and cleaner? And that's our obligation. It's our future. How do we take the past and improve on it? And that's what the Nikola one does. You know, I've met a lot of dreamers. Sometimes they have great ideas, but they can't ever get it off the ground. So when I first met Trevor, it was, it was pretty exciting to see that he actually had more than just on paper. He had a whole engineering group that had spent a lot of time putting this product together. We've built something that no one else thought was possible. And we've done it with a team of passionate, driven, young entrepreneurs, all put into one incredible team here at Nikola. Well, anytime there's new technologies in the market that we think will be a game changer, we tend to try to participate with those manufacturers that's coming to the market with them. And we tend to try to help them understand what's needed in, in our industry, because a lot of people will build a product and miss the mark. And contacting Trevor when, when he first made his announcement and then seeing his reaction to, to some of the suggestions that we we're offering, he's been, been very receptive. You know, I have no ownership in the company, but I can tell you I'm, I'm pretty excited about how the company's moving forward, how the product's coming to the market. If something can be done, it should be done. We've been able to prove it works. Now it's time for us as a company to take the products out on the road, show that they can outperform a diesel in every application, in every situation, and change the philosophy of an entire society. I think there's gonna be so many changes that once a driver gets in that truck, it's gonna be a different world for it. Going to batteries as, as opposed to diesel, being emissions free, having a vehicle that doesn't require all the maintenance that today's vehicles do, having a vehicle that's more comfortable for the driver. It's also gonna create a different world for us, the owners, uh, that have to keep these guys on the road for days at a time. And this could be that game changer that we're all looking for to enhance the availability of good quality, safe drivers. This is to all the thinkers and the inventors and the entrepreneurs that didn't stop after their first failure. It was the same thing here. We failed, we failed, we failed. <laughs> oh and then gosh. we succeeded. He's, tel he's telegraphing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. He's so ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Kevin Link. Chief Engineer, Nikola Motor Company. All right, so I'm going to pause really quickly. <laughs> um, we failed and failed and failed. Yeah. Now trust us. Yeah. Now, now give us a few this billion is gonna dollars. Be I mean, that's that, but that is the story he was telling all along. You know that this is what entrepreneurs do. They they keep trying. They don't give up. And you know, okay, that's probably true, but. <laughs> He they also have successes along the yeah. way, you know? He also said, you notice that he said, we put together a team of entrepreneurs. He, what he really needed was a team of engineers, but he didn't actually have that. He had a few, but not very many. Do you know who that dude was that was shilling for him? Uh, I mean, Yeah, that was the owner of a company called U.S. Express, which is a trucking company. So one of the reasons, when, when Nikola went public, just as an aside about U.S. Express, it's important that they... Um, were able, they worked, worked a deal with Trevor to put in a bunch of orders for these trucks. So one of the things when they went public is to express how many uh, truck orders they had. If we have you know billions of dollars worth of truck orders, that makes people really willing to invest in the company, right? Well, U.S. Express was a third of those, a third of the total orders. But the problem is, is that um, according to its public filings, it had like, you know, uh, I think it was like a hundred million dollars in the bank. Well, the number of orders that it had in res were worth uh, 3.6 billion dollars. So there's just no way that U.S. Express could ever have fulfilled its orders. It was more like a sweetheart deal. I think that he worked with Trevor's. Like Trevor said, "Hey, I, I, I'm I'm speculating here, but it's probably." He said, "We need a bunch of orders to get our stock price going. Help us out." And the guy, you know, helped him out. So one of my favorite comments so far is from uh, Joe Whip. He writes, Milton is a Mormon, question mark. Yes. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes, he is. Active to this day, as far as I know. <laughs> Tithe paying, active Mormon. Yes. All right. So let's let's play a little bit more of the clip. Now, who is this Kevin Link guy? Is this your client? Is this? No. Okay. No. He, is, he was a, an, an, I think he was an engineer 
I'm, I can't remember exactly what his role was, but he worked for uh, Nikola. And this is just to give people a sense of the fraud, yes. basically. So here's yeah. a little bit more but of that. Pay attention to what, what Trevor says. Okay. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. It's so great to see all of you here. And thank you for those who are joining us online. Is this like his cousin? My name is Kevin Lee. This guy? I'm the chief engineer for Nikola Motor Company. We certainly come a long way from where we started when we first started designing this truck in our CEO's basement. And I'm happy and excited to share with you this huge milestone for our company and for the future of trucking. Okay, can you pause it's it? It's my distinct there, Absolutely. pleasure and honor to introduce our CEO and founder, Trevor Milton. All right, so before we show that, go okay, ahead. Okay, I just want to tell you about Kevin Link, who is, I'm sure, a very nice fellow. Um, I've never met him, but when Trevor talks about bringing some of the top talent, engineering talent in the world to his company, <laughs> this guy is his head of technology, right? The, a very senior guy. Well, let me tell you what, what his jobs were. Um, uh, sorry, what his jobs were before he began <laughs> working there. Uh, we reviewed Kevin's biography on LinkedIn and found that prior to joining Nikola, he worked for seven months designing oil filled products using CAD software, <laughs> 3.5 years in software development. And prior to that, he spent uh, nine months repairing pinball machines. So this is the guy. <laughs> this is he the can't top make this engineer. stuff up, man. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look like he doesn't look like a, a MIT engineer, by yeah. the way. Uh, but he's he a, looks like a dude from Magna. He's from well, his first his mechanical engineering job at his last one it was at Profire, which is in Linden, Utah. So oh, he's, he's a, from Linden. He's a good Utah Sorry. guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't mean to be flipped, but this is just, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. All right. Link, LinkedIn uh, is not good for people who are trying to lie about their tech, their te technology people. They didn't even hide it well. No. Okay. Let's go to, uh, I guess, Trevor. Oh, yeah. He comes out on a, he comes out on a razor. Yeah. Like a four wheel. <laughs> It's like the, the Utah Tech Bro version of Steve yeah. Jobs. Oh, it right? is. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it, at least he didn't wear a turtleneck. You know, there's something. <laughs> wow. Well, a good crowd out here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, this is a really incredible time. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, quotes in the world. It just, just a couple of days ago, one of our users sent it off to us, and it just really just shocked me. It was everything I've been trying to capture and explain to people for years and years, and that is the electric light did not come from continuous improvements of candles. Dude, mic drop. That's a really yeah. hard concept yeah, to seriously. try to explain to a big okay. Fortune 500 company or a Fortune 100 or, or even a Fortune 1000. It's very, very difficult. Um, it takes a complete redesign from the ground up, and most of the time, big companies can't take those risks. Primarily Are those because uh, work? I don't know, if there John. was a failure, look, it would affect a company like it. of that size uh, much more than a smaller company like ours. And that's one of the great advantages that we have as an entrepreneur, and one of the tasks in life that we have as entrepreneurs is to be able to take risks that no one else thought was possible, that no one ever thought they could, that they could ever do. The consequences would be too great, but we took it and we achieved. It's a really incredible uh, um, story of our, of, of our time. Um, I'm going to go through a couple things. Some of you guys saw me pull up in the Nikola Zero. We're going to be talking about a lot of really incredible products tonight. Some people know a lot about Nikola. Some people are just learning. Uh, we, I want right, to obviously so thank everyone I, that's live streaming I mean, I all think, over the world. We have people all the way from here tonight. I think we get a sense here for, tonight. for what's going on here. Yeah. Is there any part of this that, that, any, uh, that I, you want me to fast forward to that's kind of really essential? Well, yeah, when, when he, after the, if you could talk about, uh, just fast forward to where he pulls the, the, uh, the cloth off of the truck. If because he he does have a long intro, but the, this is when he, you'll, you'll see several things that are really important here. One is he uses the phrase, this is not a pusher. And in the automobile industry, a pusher in is- In your future- keep, Go ahead. Keep sorry. Going. Um, a pusher is where you put a car on a stage to show how it looks, but it actually doesn't have an engine in it. Well, that truck that he's pointing to was 100% a pusher. It had no engine at all. It had a few gears above the <laughs> wheels, but there was no engine in it. There was no power to it other than what was coming up through the stage in a 
in an extension cord. That's what was powering the screens that he that he looks at down the way. So that ended up being really important in the. Uh, can, can you find that? I don't know if you can find that that time. It's taking me a second. Okay. So so it literally was a pusher. It and was yet a pusher. He was telling everybody, it, but, it, it is a pusher. Yeah, and and he actually said. Um, he said that we've we've uh, uh, developed this truck, and it, and he went to, goes into quite a bit of detail about how there's a chain in the cockpit so that people don't get in and drive it off the stage, which is just <laughs> ridiculous because they would you'd have to get a bunch of people and push it to get it off that stage. It was literally towed uh, towed up there um, by another truck, so it it was not it was a pusher. Yet he repeatedly says. Um, he repeatedly says that it was uh, a fully operable truck, which was not true. All right, so let's. There, I, I fast forwarded to like three quarters into the presentation, okay. where it looks like it? he's about to play a video that looks like it's about to be in advance of the reveal. So behind let's, every let's milestone and every innovation, is this the famous video? In every industry, no. craft, no, okay. trade. Couple years later. Okay. There exists a mover, a mover, someone who gets things where they need to be. <laughs> And gets them there yeah, fast. Ever. <laughs> so like that's supposed to be in one of his tracks, right? Like yeah. functional, right? Well, I, I don't know These what it's supposed to be. These movers make the world we know possible. <laughs> Our progress depends on their commitment to that's a job a done well truck, and a job done yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> they bridge our networks and span our gaps. Where others see obstacles that defy success, movers see nothing but open road. Hmm. They know the ins and outs of this country. Every inch of asphalt from New York City to Los Angeles. This is almost parody. They've long hauled yeah. the Rockies and the Cascades. This feels like a Saturday Night Live. Through the Shenandoah Valley and you know, the Blue Ridge the Mountains. Credit. He's a sales guy. Yeah. They've seen shorelines, plains, cities, <laughs> and suburbs. They've seen the Great Lakes and crossed the Mississippi countless times. Time. They put tools in our reach. <laughs> The tools we need to transform today's <laughs> ambitions into the accomplishments of tomorrow. Movers jumpstart innovation. <laughs> they move our dreams and our inspiration. They move our joy and our laughter. <laughs> they move our shelter and That's our safety. Utah mom rolling That's in the leaves saying. with their this daughter. They move the bonds that forge our identity. Well, they coffee. move the common good yeah. we cherish it's in spite edgy. of division. I mean, this is a really long intro that has nothing to do. They move the moments we share with, with our families Christ. around the dinner table. <laughs> There's apples and yeah. apple pie. They move the world. <laughs> like, what the? But what moves them? Tell us. For too long, we've asked the movers who make our dreams possible <laughs> oh to God. depend on outdated technology. <laughs> okay. A technology that compromises the planet we work so tirelessly toward perfecting. I mean, come on! For too long, we've asked I, them I to sacrifice their health the and their safety so we can have better access to the things Smash that give trucks. our lives meaning. For the too dog. long, we've ignored <laughs> the simple fact that what we move comes at a cost. A cost to our environment, to the movers, to our future, and to ourselves. Come on, it's man. easy to accept what we have without questioning how we got it. It's easy to accept modest change also, that's outpaced the by the rate of All our failures. All these pictures of trucks are not the truck. <laughs> when we accept these failures, we choose to fail the same people who, for more than I'm half a century, have, have refused to this, fail us. But... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't... Movers revolutionized our world. Here we go. Here's the it's truck. It's time we revolutionize the... theirs. Spinning on the stage. Spinning on the stage. For those who bravely stand at the crossroads of innovation and enterprise. And they had to like. For those who are prepared to give our children a moral compass and not right just there. a road map. Those lights you're seeing are not powered for from those the truck. who They're wish to leave the planet cord. better than oh, it like was when we found it. Yeah. Everything. For those who are driven. For those who dare to reinvent. For those who dare to reimagine. Nicola one. There it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. And everybody's smiling and taking photos and all right. Is that is that what we should show for that yeah, one? Yeah. I mean, he then gets up and and you can see it, but he actually says, you know, um, I'll, I'll read the words that he said. 
This truck is by far the most state-of-the-art truck ever built in history. <laughs> this thing fully functions and works. This is a real truck. This is not a pusher. That's the quote that you get in a minute. And Gary Herbert, our governor, is staying up there with him and while he's just absolutely lying through his teeth about what was underneath the hood of that truck. Um, so he had press there, and it was more just to hype, you know, to get it ready for eventually um, uh, going public. That's what he's doing. He's get building hype, building hype with the press in order to get people to buy his stock when he goes public. Okay. So, so what here's, happens here's next? a big twist, big twist here <laughs> that people probably didn't even notice, but stenciled on that truck uh, in, in you, know, you know, maybe six inches by 20 inches or whatever <laughs> is H. Uh, H2 hydrogen. So two weeks before this reveal, he changed his entire business model, like entire business model to say that this truck is no longer powered by natural gas. It's now going to be powered by hydrogen um, that is powering the battery recharging, right? So some engine needs to power the batteries to get recharged so you don't have to pull over and plug in every 10 minutes. So what happened is he changed his entire business model because Technically speaking, um, hydrogen is cleaner, burns cleaner. There's no emissions from hydrogen. There are some emissions from uh, natural gas. And so he, in, in all of his engineering, he, uh, engineering people are like, what? You know, what are you talking about? We, that's, we've been working towards this compressed natural gas for years now, and all of a sudden you're changing our entire business model. Now, let me say this, that, that hydrogen technology does exist. You can run a hydrogen engine, right? But hydrogen itself is very, very expensive to produce. And so there were all these new, um, and, and also the engines that power uh, hydrogen generators are very complicated and huge. They would have weighed tens of thousands of pounds that would have been way too heavy. So there were extreme technological challenges to this shift. And so plot twist again, he hires um, someone to be in charge of developing um, natural gas, or excuse me, uh, uh, hydrogen fuel stations, because there aren't any. So you'd have to be able to fill it up along the way, right? Well, he decides that he's going to not only develop trucks that are technologically un, uh, you know, unlike anything else out there, but he was then going to figure out how to make hydrogen at a cheap price and make it in such volume that we could, and then implement gas stations throughout the United States so people can refill their trucks. So just think about the challenges of this business model. It was absurdly challenging to be able to accomplish all of these things to, to, to generate the hydrogen. Anyway, so all of his engineers who the engineers he did have there were there a few, one of them is my client were like, you what hydrogen? What? They didn't even know that hydrogen was going to be on the truck until mm. that sheet came <laughs> off. That's how much advanced notice the engineers had. Again, another, illustration of the idea that the bigger the lie the yeah sometimes the more people yeah. believe it if you build it they make it fake it till you make it yeah. right yeah so so later he did admit after bloomberg revealed that that was all a farce that 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 whole reveal was not a real operative truck he did admit that it, it wasn't operable after all so uh, someone did bloomberg did yeah in 2016 or 17 they published an article kind of saying that truck was not actually what so they did investigative was. reporting or whatever kind of but mostly it was because my client paul uh reached out to them and said hey this guy is full of you know what um he had worked for he was for, the guy that put the thing together oh, he okay. knew what was underneath the well hood. then he was complicit well he was uh out he was a contractor but he felt complicit yes and he felt angry about it because he saw what was happening he saw that um, when Trevor brought people into the, the company and gave them tours, there was really not much engineering going on, just selling, and that he was always trying to bring in more money. Um, and so he was really offended by it, and that's why he contacted Bloomberg. Hmm. And that's ultimately why we began working with him as well. Okay. Well, so, okay. So when Bloomberg says that wasn't a real truck, uh, Trevor Milton's response is... What, I never said it was? <laughs> yeah, he basically said, well, you know, I didn't actually say that. I just, and, and oh, by the way, there was a, 
a, a, a table with parts on front of it so people would have known that that wasn't true. Well, that's not true. There's nothing in that video you just showed with a, a truck, a, a table full of parts. That just wasn't true. So he, he, and then he threatened to sue Bloomberg, which, but he did not do that. And he um, tried to get the reporter fired. <laughs> okay. So, right. doesn't, doesn't like criticism. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah, what, what, what comes next? What leads us to the second video? <laughs> so uh, we actually, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen uh, in, in the interim. He began to continue to develop this. And he began making statements on social media about the capabilities that, he, that his truck had. And I'm not, I'm going to get the timing of this, the chronology wrong, I'm sure. But at some point, he began claiming that he could um, make hydrogen for $3 a gallon, which or $3 a kilogram or something, whatever it is, that would make it competitive with diesel. Well, that was just not true. He, he had never made a single ounce of hydrogen. He didn't have the technology. He didn't have the engineers. But he nevertheless just started getting out there on Twitter and on Instagram and telling people that he'd accomplished this really a uh, huge, uh, get another, <laughs> you know, like last time when he said he doubled the, the life of batteries, this was another like huge engineering marvel that he claimed to have accomplished, which was just not true. And I'm just dying to know, was like Elon Musk, like, hey, come on, let me come see Trevor. Let me see. Let me talk to your engineers. Like, let's partner. Like, uh, where's yeah. Elon? I guess that's my question. I don't know. I think Elon didn't give these guys any credit. I don't know. <clears throat> he was not, he didn't like them. They, Trevor Milton hated Elon. He was jealous of what he had accomplished from all we could tell. He actually sued Elon when Elon what? started developing his own electric truck. What? Then he sued him. So there was litigation there. He sued <laughs> him for like $2 billion for stealing their design, which was ridiculous because <laughs> um, they had bought the design from some dude in Germany anyway. So <laughs> we also... Um, so then again, he starts hyping more things about the technology. He claims that they're developing it in house, the, the, the hydrogen. And then this is another, here's another LinkedIn moment for us. And, and we'll talk about how we put together this report in a minute. But we discovered in the course of this, that, that the guy that he'd put in charge of this hugely complicated uh, task of rolling out infrastructure uh, for hydrogen distribution, right? You think about gas stations everywhere in the country. Imagine a whole new a whole new network of new gas stations that have hydrogen, or or maybe he could partner with someone. But whatever, hugely complicated task. Well, the guy he put in charge of it was his little brother. <laughs> of course, <laughs> and, also from Linden. <laughs> yes, uh, from St. George. But no, but more recently, so we also looked at his LinkedIn and his job. This is true. I am not kidding you. His job before being the head of hydrogen infrastructure was he was pouring cement in Hawaii. <laughs> not an engineer. Never okay. been an engineer. And so but a bro. From, but a bro. And he's literally Trevor's bro. And he got like 110 a bro. million shares uh, as, as a part of that. I mean, he got this huge stock uh, uh, allotment because he was part of the company. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Again, all, all you have to do is pull up the guy on LinkedIn and you can see that he was literally uh, a driveway pouring uh, uh, subcontractor in Hawaii. It's like, we've got David Whitmer and John Whitmer, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and That's Oliver right. Cowdery. Like, we've got the entire Whitmer family. we got the whole gang. And it's just coincidence. <laughs> They're really the most qualified people. We've got Joseph F. Smith. We've got Joseph Fielding Smith. We've got Joseph Smith. It's just coincidence that they all have that same name. Don't forget Hiram. Oh, Hiram. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and Joseph Sr. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway, okay. he comes by it honestly, too much fun. right? Right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I'll skip ahead because I don't want to. I, I, I want to tell the story about what happened afterward. But he <laughs> eventually in 2020, in March of 2020, wait, we got to show the video. Oh, the wait, famous video. The fin Oh, does that come yeah, after? Or? Yeah, no, it comes after. Oh, okay, it was okay, right okay, sorry, before sorry, they went going. public. Okay, keep going. So sorry. no, no, no. This is a good time for okay, that. Okay. So so at some point <laughs> again after the big reveal, people kept saying, "Well, is this?" Is this real? Where's my prototype? Yeah, like like show it. You say you've got all this working technology. Why don't you post a video of your technology? So finally, he decided, oh, 
dang, I guess I better, oh gosh darn it, I guess I better <laughs> Go. uh, uh, <laughs> I better show them a, a truck that's driving. A functional truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you go. So then he uh, <laughs> he publishes, he posts this. This this became infamous. This is what everyone, uh, this was the big reveal down the road where why our report got so much interest. Is this pre-IPO? or This post is barely pre-IPO. I believe it was 2019. And, and just what the video is going to show is a functional Nikola truck in in or around uh the great salt lake yes. right 2018 but, on on a road called the mormon trail but, <laughs> believe it or not that is a true story you can't make this no up. no but what did he actually do is it well, you gotta this, show the video first oh, really? you gotta you let him let all right him see so he, how it, but, uh, but 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 listeners won't be able to see it but i'll, oh, I'll try and narrate it okay. all right so so here's <laughs> here's the quote functional nicola truck driving around uh, the the Great Salt Lake on Mormon what the Mormon the Mormon Trail Mormon Trail here it goes is out out by like Magna or someplace out <laughs> okay. there. So imagine a truck that looks like a Nikola truck driving through the fields of Magna slash the Great Salt Lake. Uh, now it's parked. You know, it's uh, it's 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 stopping at the stop signs like. This could be out of like uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, yeah. with it. <laughs> and there's the sun and there's, I guess, uh, drone drone coverage of the truck. And it says Nikola One. And uh, I mean, so, I mean. So people couldn't see that on the YouTube? Could did I did I not I show it? No, I think up? you did. I think you did. Okay, so in maybe the, I didn't. Maybe I didn't click the button. Uh, no, I saw it on this TV. I don't. I don't know how your technology works. But all right, let me just because I think I may have goofed. Let me let me see if let me. What are people are saying people saying the that chat? they couldn't see it? I'll, I'll show it one more time. So, but, but let me just. Oh, we saw it. They, well, they, 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 they did see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So go ahead and. Uh, Keep going. Sorry, I keep looking to the side, everyone. That's because that's where the monitor is. Okay, so um, people saw it. All right, keep okay. going. So, okay, so like, well, really quickly, like it looked like a fake, just a fake normal truck. So which what, which part of that? Okay, I don't want to be, I guess, same, spoiler. It was the same unit that was unveiled or, or two, three years earlier, or okay. two years earlier, right? It's the Nucola One. Okay. And they, they uh, posted it on Twitter and said, behold, the Nicola One in motion. Pre-production units hit fleets in 2019 for testing. The Nikola hydrogen electric trucks will take on any semi-truck and outperform them in every category. Weight, acceleration, stopping, safety, all with a 500 to 1,000 mile range. So they called it in motion, and this became an issue. But everyone saw that video and was like, oh, look, they, they're driving the truck. The truck oh, works. So the people who are just listening, and I'll just I'll play it really quickly, okay. just oh, really I, quickly I, I for just a second. Now you'll... So it's the same truck that was on stage, and it looks like it's moving down yeah, the road. Yeah, it looks like it's driving. The problem is what? <laughs> it was coasting. There was no engine in it. <laughs> and so it's it's literally like they put it on an incline. Yeah. So it's going downhill. They identified. <laughs> this is the crazy thing. I don't. Can people hear me? The, this is the crazy thing about this is they they did a bunch of research to find a very gradual straight road, and then they towed it. Literally towed it. And they had the actor driving it had to sign a non-disclosure agreement so he didn't talk about <laughs> what it was that he was driving and then they filmed it with all these drones and stuff to make it look like it was driving and then they changed the angle <laughs> so the you camera. really cannot see <laughs> that that's actually not a flat road it's a it's a it's a hill but a very gradual hill so literally it's the same pusher that he showed yes. on stage two years same earlier track. yeah but like faked to look like it was rolling that it was driving yes when it was really towed up to a spot and and rolling down a hill. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and everyone loved it. They're like, oh, look, they got it to work. And, and in fact, my client, who was the engineer that put the thing together, saw that on Twitter. And he said, what? Well, how did they get that ready to go? They never hired me to come back and finish the project because he had been he'd left after that unveiling and never came back to Salt Lake City. So he couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. If, if people are listening on podcast on the podcast, John, they can Google Nicola One in Motion and you can find this video is all over the place because this became a really big deal when we released our report and revealed for the first time that that was fake. 
Yeah, it's 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 one of the most iconic videos yeah, on is. YouTube of the past ten years for people who follow business. Yeah, yeah. Now I also have a clip of him appearing on Roadshow in the cockpit of yeah. the truck. Is this the same around the same time? Yes. Is it okay if I play a little yeah, bit of that? Yeah, play that, and and then notice what happens <laughs> when he tries to pinch the screen to expand it. Just just okay. watch that. Part. All right. Well, I, I don't know how long this video is, but it's, let's just play the I beginning don't think it's at least. Too long. It's an eight-minute video, so. <laughs> hey, everyone. I am here with Trevor Milton. He is the CEO of Nikola Motor Company, and we're in a very, very special truck, the Nikola uh -huh. One, America's first, very or probably the <laughs> world's special. first, hydrogen electric semi-truck. Yeah. It's really the first electric truck in the whole world that can go more than 200 miles. It's a full 1,200 miles, th up to 1,300 miles on a full Down range hill. of, uh, of hydrogen. Hill. <laughs> hydrogen is a zero emission fuel. As long as you can find 1,000 miles uh, has, uh, hill. It has no emissions whatsoever. The only byproduct is water. So how long have you been working on this? Because this is this is a fully functioning truck right here that yeah. we're sitting in. So how Not long have you guys true. been working on this? Uh, years in secrecy. <laughs> it's been very hard. Um, some yeah. of the some of the people have found out about us over the last four or five months as we announced some of the mm -hmm. uh, the lead up to this big event, but it took years and years to get here. Um, this isn't just a pusher like a lot of vehicles that they unveil are just vehicles that don't actually function. Mm -hmm. There's a fully functioning. Okay. Uh, so there it is. Uh, vehicle, which is really he's incredible. trying to expand can, the, you know, the little iPad out, uh, there. Nothing much happened. Everything we want, and those were just fake I mean, this screens, is a fully by the way. Vehicle. Nothing not was actually a, usable. Not just a pusher. That's what they call it in the automotive world a vehicle that. They just push and it doesn't move. All right, so let's go through some of these things. I mean, here I've got a 21 inch touch screen. This one's actually not the 21. The 21 okay. will actually encompass this into, uh, entire area here in okay. production. So it'll be changed. Right now, this is a uh, okay. this is a 15 inch monitor yeah. here. It's exactly okay. what um, it is. And then it has dual seven inch and a, and a uh, 10 inch up there. So this is a 15. In production, it'll be a full 21 inch. And that'll right. give the driver the ability to actually see all the different freight that is in their um, so, freight that's in the so, uh, system. So, you know, for those okay. who are- um, It's cool are, because the driver has the ability to access all Wi-Fi, 4G over the air. Uh -huh. um, I mean, so for those who- And it lets them actually get all the- Who aren't uh, um, able to see this, he's sitting at this cockpit with this tech journalist, business mm -hmm. journalist, with some lights and some screens, you know, acting like this is a, a yeah. really fully functioning dashboard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But then he tries to to expand <laughs> the screen and nothing happens because it was all static and it was all powered through a cord that came up through the through underneath the stage. And I'm just again like he's got a bunch of people he's hired. Somebody would have had to written the software for this iPad that's sitting there acting like it's really a, a functioning dashboard. And then all these engineers that are supposed to be in charge of hydrogen or distribution channels or the motor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are they not asking questions about why are we showing this on display floor on, on display floors? Why are we having product launches, IPOs? Yeah. Why why are we g taking investors when we none of us have gotten any of this to actually work right. in any functional way? Not only it was years away from anything real, and the technology that he was claiming they that they had already accomplished was not at all. There was nobody even working on it when he claimed that they knew how to do hydrogen, there was not a single employee in the company that was working on hydrogen, not one. So the engineers, yeah, they were all kind of like looking at each other saying, what the hell, Did, what is he saying? What is he promising? And uh, he's making these kind of representations on social media, on Twitter, in these podcasts all over the place. And I'm just thinking again, where are the whistleblowers? You know what well, I mean? And I know you've already answered it. Yeah. Litigiousness, NDAs. Very, very worried. Yeah. Yeah, they were very yeah. worried. So this is 2018. Things moved pretty quickly at that point. And then they went public in, I believe, uh, March of uh, of uh, 2020. So and right some, beginning some, of COVID. And I'm guessing some investment bank, probably some California or New York, either Silicon Valley or Wall Street investment bank, would have done due diligence they wouldn't have done an ipo without like checking out the tech and like well, looking at the balance sheets like certainly those companies don't do multi-billion dollar ipos without any credible due diligence right except <laughs> this was not an ipo it oh. went public through what's called a spac a special purpose acquisition <laughs> okay. company so when an ipo and this is in the weeds a little bit but when an i when a company goes public through an ipo they have what's called a quiet period where they're not allowed to comment at all 
what happened is Nikola had another company formed and had that company go public, but it was a shell. And then they merged with the shell that was already public at that point and renamed Man, the shell. What a shyster. Nikola. And this was in, in 2020, this was a big deal. All the SPACs, all these companies were doing SPACs and they were getting around a lot of the securities laws. There was much more lax and it enabled, this is really important. This enabled Trevor to avoid what's called the lockup period where he can't sell his stock. So because he went public through a SPAC, he was able to immediately sell. I think within the first few months, he sold $70 million in stock. He bought a the $32 million ranch up in uh, Oakley. He bought uh, dude, three private planes. Dude, three. if it's okay, let me just show. I actually have... One of the whistleblowers or one of the people that have been trying to get him busted for years, he shared with me some photos of what, what this dude bought. So yeah. so here I'm showing on the screen an Audi R8 for uh, 200,000 plus, a 2019 Quest Kodiak Airplane 100 for $3 million. And there's... I guess that's Trevor Milton with his dog kissing him. I can't see it on the screen. Uh, is it on your is uh, it on your screen there? Uh -huh. It's definitely on the live stream. Oh, okay. Um a five million dollar TBM, no pun intended, TBM. Um uh a, a, a nine forty turbo prop for five million dollars. Yeah. There's a twenty twenty Gulfstream six hundred for fifty nine million dollars. There is a fly-in residence in Alpine, Wyoming for $6 million. Is it on your screen now? I, I'm not watching it. There's a Milton's dad's fly-in residence in Alpine, Wyoming <laughs> for $6.5 million. Don't you have a fly-in residence, John? <laughs> 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 There's, he, and this is all really fast. I mean, he didn't wait for several years for the company to be established. I mean, he 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 liquidated seventy million right the off the strike bat. Strike while the iron's yep, hot, right? Yep. And he began living the lifestyle, driving the cars, flying the planes. I mean, because the jigs are going to be up pretty soon, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, so you yeah. well pull your money, take up. advantage of it while yeah. you can. All right, let's go back. So um, we're not done, by the way. Um, so there's the <laughs> there's the Phoenix Mansion with indoor basketball court for two point two million. There's the fifty acre mansion in Woodland, Utah for 25.9 million. And then there is the uh, 2600 acre ranch in Oakley, Utah for 32 million yeah. 500,000. That's not bad. Made the paper. Not bad. Made the made the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. By the way, that purchase of that uh, property. Just uh, this is you can't make that. This needs to be like a Jared right. Hess, a Jared Hess produced movie. Yeah. And right? it was, it was. And if you see Jared, talk to him because you know we're looking. Anyway, uh, he used to be in my parents' ward. Uh, the the one thing though is that this all he bought all this stuff literally within weeks of going public. In most IPOs, you'd never be able to do that. So he wanted to live the lifestyle. There's a great anecdote. One of our clients said that when they were talking about all the all the advantages they were driving, they just met Trevor. They were driving through Portland, talking about all the great advantages of the technology and how it could save the environment. And Trevor made this statement in the car. He said. I don't give a shit about the environment. I just want to make money. And that was probably one of the truest statements that he made. And this, by the way, shocked the engineers who were in the EV building business precisely because they were very environmentally conscious. So they really were shocked by this statement that he made. Still worked with them, but... I just texted uh, Jared Hess and told him okay. he needs to make Trevor Milton the movie. <laughs> yeah. Nicola the movie. Yeah, let's do it. By Jared Hess. <laughs> so, But I, I was going to say, John, there's there's one other thing that he did after he went public is he started telling people that he was making um, – he was making uh, hydrogen in this big building in Arizona that they were working out of. And he claimed that they were making all this hydrogen and they were making it at $3 a gallon, which would have been a, a, a marvel of engineering if that was true. It was not true. And he claimed he was making it all with power, with solar power. So it was like a totally <laughs> off-the-grid warehouse. Well, he claimed that he was make, had like some number of gigawatt uh, gigawatts of power being generated by the solar panels on the roof. Well, ultimately, we showed that, in fact, we all you, we did is go to Google Maps and get a the this um, view of the warehouse from the sky, and there were no solar panels panels on the roof, not one, zero. <laughs> but he claimed that there were. I mean, again, this isn't hard to disprove. 
But um, we we spent months putting together this report and disproving all of these claims that he was making. I mean, this is a perfect example of confirmation bias, where people pay attention yeah. to the things they want to believe and That's they right. ignore the things they don't want right. to believe. Right. So, so perfect example of that is just uh, I think two months after the company went public, they signed a deal with General Motors. <laughs> I've got General a clip. Motors. I've got yeah. a clip. So that's go ahead and show that because that's you talk about this confirmation bias, <laughs> and you talk about doing research into all these things that were readily. Um, read, readily provable as false, and GM missed it all. Yeah, so like this, this clip is you know it's a few minutes, but this is the CEO of GM mm -hmm. announcing a partnership with Trevor Milton and Nicola on CNBC. Yeah, and they're talking. I, it's just mind blowing. So we we got to roll the clip. Welcome back to Swagbox, Nicola, forming a strategic partnership with General Motors this morning. Nicola Badger will be engineered and manufactured by GM. GM getting an 11% ownership stake in Nicola's result and the right to nominate one director to the board. Joining us right now to talk all about it is Trevor Milton, founder and executive chairman of Nicola, and Mary Barra, CEO of GM. Good morning to both of you. I'm going to start on the GM side, if I could, Mary, and try to try to get a sense of how you were thinking about this partnership and why you ended up deciding to do this. And then I want to get to Trevor on what it really means. Thanks, Andrew. All right, really quickly, I'm going to apologize for a second. There's a bit of an echo there. There's a bit of an echo there. I think I uh, I tried to record this so that it would be for sure available, wouldn't have ads, and it's oh. got a bit of an echo there. Yeah. But I think it it kind of makes the point, right? There's there's the CEO on yeah. CNBC, and it's showing the stock ticker. So it's got General Motors up 8% to 32 46 per share. And then it's got Nikola Corporation up 40% to almost $50 a yeah. share. Like, that's real money. No, they, at the time that we issued our report, Nikola was worth more than Ford Motor Company. So like, uh, and I apologize for this. So just for those who missed it. Um, so like vaporware, you, like he strikes a deal with the CEO of, of GM. GM's a legitimate, serious, oh, yeah. what, Fortune 50, At least. you know, company. Yeah. And and he's able to pull the 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 wool over her eyes and with vaporware and, and, and with her legal department supposedly would have looked into this deal and said is he got anything that he can offer what does he bring to the table i don't know what happened someone dropped the ball big time yeah so like like again like t talk about the ex how much he was worth and how much this deal was okay. and so within uh, um days within several months ultimately of the going public um in 2020 Trevor Milton's wealth grew and grew. He had, you know, millions and millions of shares in Nikola. He was the largest shareholder and he became, I believe, I'm not sure where it to topped out, but I believe he was worth $8 billion at one point. $8 billion Yeah. For vaporware. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hopefully people can hear us if you can message us. Oh, they us. can now. They, they can, can now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, the other thing is that he be, he began, you know, on this spending spree but he didn't stop talking. Now, as a securities lawyer, I just have to say that, you know, when you're a CEO or chief executive of a publicly traded company, everything you say you could put you in jail, everything. You have to be extremely careful about what you say about your technology. But Trevor um, didn't ever stop. He didn't ever slow down. He just kept wanting the stock to go up. So he would say whatever it took to get that stock price to continue to raise. And the problem with that is that um, he had a whole legal department. He had at least a general counsel we know of who um, we now know was uh, trying to tell him to stop. The other people, his engineers, his CFO, were saying, Trevor, it's a public company now. You need to stop saying these things. You can only say things that are verifiably true. And he would not. He would not stop. And we know that because after this all blew up, the company, Nikola, after they fired Milton, they had a whole internal investigation done and it was released. And so we know that all of his executives had been telling him all along to stop doing what he was doing and he wouldn't listen. Okay. Sorry, I jumped ahead in the story a little bit. No, 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 that's that's totally fine. Um, 
So, you know, eventually he he's going to be stepping down and then there are going to be other allegations. Mm -hmm. but, but let me take yeah, a, yeah. a step back, please. So so what happened two weeks after, <clears throat> excuse me, two weeks after the GM deal just that you just showed was released, was announced. Um, a group called Hindenburg Research out of New York released its report against it, literally two weeks. So it, the stock was, I think, at $60 a share at that point, and it just plummeted. So that's where I come in. Okay. Yeah, well, let's talk about, let's talk about that first. <clears throat> okay. So how does this get unraveled? <laughs> so so in um, 2000, early 2020, I was contacted by the guy who had started Dehybrid with Trevor and taught him the technology who wasn't actually had invented this technology, uh, this hybrid technology that Trevor then used this whole time. Um, this guy's name is, is well, and what, one of, actually, let me step back. One of the first people that contacted me was a guy named Darren Brooks, who was one of the early investors. And uh, he had gotten a letter from Trevor's lawyer saying, hey, I'm gonna, I know you invested 30 grand, we're gonna offer you $600 to buy out your shares. And then, um, meanwhile, he saw on the news that Trevor had just bought and had just purchased a $32 million mansion. And so he was understandably um, shocked and confused about how someone who's only offering a pittance to buy back his shares could have just purchased a $32 million ranch that was on the in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so he contacted me. And at that point in my career, I was uh, doing much more whistleblower work, representing whistleblowers on all sorts of different stuff. And so I, and I'm, I'm, I may be the only lawyer that does this in any significant way in the whole um, state of Utah. So he found his way to me and talked to me. And uh, <clears throat> then I began investigating. We, it's a longer story, but we ultimately found Mike Shrout through a bunch of calls. Um, Mike and I started working together. He was the engineer that had helped with the technology from day one. By the way, that, it, that stuff, uh, Trevor had filed a patent for a patent of that technology, and he hadn't put Mike Shrout's name on it. So Trevor not only stole the company from Mike Shrout, he stole the technology and attempted to patent it uh, without giving Mike any credit for that patent. So that was, Mike was super uh, pissed off, to put it mildly, but, you know, life had moved on and he was very um, sad, but he just didn't know what to do. And so then at some point we put together, uh, we grew our group uh, of whistleblowers. We found the engineer who had worked, uh, who had been with Trevor up in Portland. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Paul Lackey. Uh, that's also, this is all public information. Uh, Paul then began working with us. Then we began realizing that, you know, the amount of information that we had and, and especially Mike had a whole garage. He was like a beautiful mind guy. You know, he had all these whiteboards with, uh, he had boxes and boxes of information and we all, every email he'd ever sent uh, and re or received from Trevor he had. So we needed more horsepower and we brought in Hindenburg uh, research out of New York and their researchers. They had a team of, I think four people at that point, And we brought them in to help us put together this report. And so we worked for a number of months uh, to put together uh, a report uh, that was then released uh, two weeks after the GM announcement. And if people want to find that report, it's quite lengthy, but you can get a lot more detail about what we, what really my clients put that together. I really can't take credit for that report. It was done by the clients. They all worked together very, you know, really 24 seven for a long time to put this together. And you can, if you Google Hindenburg and Nicola, You'll, it'll pop up and you can read the report. Well, I'm also I'm also going to share it right now again. I've shared it uh, once already in the comments, but I'm going to share it again. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So that, it's a it's a brilliant report. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and it, the takedown is so clear. Um, the uh, uh, it was so devastating. Now let me just pause and say that Hindenburg Research. I don't want anyone to think that I'm hiding the ball here. Hindenburg Research is an activist short seller which means that, that they, and they prominently disclose this in the report and in the tweets that they send out when they release their report, um, that they have taken a short position in, in Nikola stock at that point. So they took a fairly substantial position. I don't actually know how big it was, 
they shorted the stock in a big way and then re released their report. And then the re then they make money if the stock drops. So the better the report, the more money they make. And so they were absolutely incentivized financially to do this. But someone had to do it. I mean, it was just well, sitting and they out can't, there. If they lie, they get in trouble, right? right? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. they can get sued, and they get sued by Milton and Nicola, which, by the way, that was Nicola's first response is we're going to sue them. And, you know, my, uh, uh, Nate Anderson, who owns Hindenburg, said, you know, bring it. So, yeah, exactly. So because that that report was so well researched with backup for every point that we made. Yeah. Yeah. Because because if they were just making stuff up, then then like with the Donald Trump election, um, you know, election machines case, mm -hmm. then you lose. You lose. You get sued for defamation. Yes. The evidence hopefully wins out. Yes. And uh, and Trevor Milton's just got a, a couple billion dollars extra that's right to run his legitimate trucking company so right. like i love the legal system because it can hopefully vet out uh legitimate you know claims versus false claims and on top of that the market uh the stock market also has a way of doing that right now if these claims were investigated and turned out not to be true then nate and hindenburg would have lost money on that trade right they were short they were very exposed you can lose a ton of money on a short if you're not right so if the stock goes the opposite direction because the market doesn't believe your report then you're toast i mean you can lose millions and millions of dollars just like that so there was risk there and that's why i'm not an activist short seller i i don't do that stuff i would never touch that it's so risky but these guys have balls of steel can i say that on your on your podcast you just did okay yeah <laughs> they do have that and nate in particular who's become a friend of mine um he he was this was scary because he was not very well known at that point. And this was a huge uh, thing for him. And it, because of the, it, when the video uh, of the truck rolling down the hill was exposed, that was one of the big things that was picked up by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, all the big publications, CNBC, it was all over about this report. And, and they actually profiled Nate. I mean, it was a big deal. And the, Expo information that was exposed really just took that you know most people if I tell them have you heard of Nicola they'd say no and then I say have you heard of that company that had a truck they rolled down the hill they're like oh yeah yeah that <laughs> one so that that for whatever reason that piece of that reveal in the report was what really got people's attention yeah okay so this um this report comes out yeah and then how soon after do, do the wheels start falling off the wagon uh, or quick. the or the pusher should pretty I say. quick yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um so they uh trevor milton and what year is this around this is 2020 okay. in i think september three years ago or august three august, this september. is three years ago yeah it's not very long ago. okay i mean kind of long i don't know it depends on how you look at it it's a long right for before my memory. covid right right it, during covid oh during COVID. Okay. yeah yeah and so uh we released the report and the stock just plummeted and uh, the my clients, uh, you know, I'm on the phone with them and they're watching the stock price and they're watching the fallout. They're watching all the news pick it up. They're watching how many people saw it on Twitter. I mean, it was a very exciting day. I remember it very vividly, just sitting at my computer, talking to these guys <laughs> on the phone. What, did you see what happened? Or someone said, it was just really fun. It was a fun thing for us. And I'm sure it wasn't very fun for Trevor. I was prepping some video and I may have missed your answer to this. Are you able to share what your role is representing this client? Why they, what part you play? So I was in this situation and we have different cases uh, where we work with researchers of different types. We represent um, whistleblowers all over the world, literally currently. And in many cases we see people that have certain information, but then they might need to get someone else that brings in a different aspect, ability or knowledge to the, to the table. So in this case, what we did is I put together a guy who had worked with Trevor before, another guy who worked with Trevor later when they were putting together the one, the, the Nicola one, and then Tindenberg, and we put them together as essentially a whistleblower team. My role is to file a whistleblower report with the SEC, which we did. And, and I apologize if you've already answered this. How did they find you? How did they know you were working on this before? Well, we... we the clients actually found each other in okay. most cases and they would refer and I, sometimes I, I made a bunch of calls trying to figure out if anyone would talk to us and then I put them together. They wrote the report. I did not. I was not the writer, I, but I was the one that facilitated it just because I thought this was really exciting Got it. and significant. <clears throat>
So how soon after the report is released is uh, Trevor Milton stepping down? I think two days. What? Yeah, it two was days? really fast. What the? It was really fast. All right, well, I've got, I've got a clip of that announcement on CBC. Okay, go. With these same folks who were talking to the GM chairman. Yeah. And the same folks <laughs> that were talking about due diligence. Yeah. And I'm hoping to, to heaven that this, uh, that this clip uh, actually works. So I'm going to unmute the site. I am going to hit play. And we are hopefully going to see um, this. We are investigating allegations made by Hindenburg. Nicholas says that Milton agreed to relinquish 4.9 million performance-based stock units that had been granted to him back in August. Check out the stock that was down by 29.5% this morning. It declined about $10. In a tweet, Milton said that he intends to defend himself against false allegations leveled by outside detractors. Nicola, Nicola, board member, Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Grist, Gersky, has been appointed chairman, effective immediately. He previously served as vice chairman of General Motors, and remember, just about a week and a half ago, GM took an 11% stake in the company and said that it will produce Nicola's hydrogen fuel cell pickup truck by the end of 2020. Check out GM shares, which, by the way, were up pretty significantly on the news that it had taken the stake in Nicola. They're down about 3.8% this morning. Weird. Uh, we'll, we'll see, see what, what comes, comes out. out. Um, but obviously, <laughs> Hindenburg looks somewhat vindicated. So okay, if someone, and guys, if someone says, uh, I don't want to make this about me, I want it to be about the company. <laughs> what we weren't making it, what the people were making it about Milton, they're making it about the company. I mean, either, either they got proprietary technology or, or not. I mean, is that. Doesn't that, that sound like obfuscation? Kind of, I don't know. We'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, fake. But he, he's a, he was worth a billion dollars. I don't know if he's below that at this point. I might get a lot of it, too, especially if, uh, you know, if, if some of it has been hyped a little. I think Phil, we need to talk to Phil. <laughs> That's my favorite line. It's like, we, we got to talk to Phil. <laughs> Where's Phil? <laughs> Somebody call Phil. <laughs> like, what? what? Like they're kind of shell shocked, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, and they've been hyping this truck like everybody else had the the whole industry. You know, uh, who's that guy Kramer? You know, he's always yelling. He he loved Nikola. I mean, the whole thing was was kind of embarrassing, I think, for the financial press because they did not catch it, and they would like to have, right? They like to be the ones to release this stuff, but that statement that he said, hey, um, that was that Hindenburg was vindicated, and that is true. Uh, Hindenburg was entirely vindicated. And on top of that, the company, as I mentioned earlier, did a total complete uh, internal investigation. They hired an outside law firm to come in and interview all of the executives. And they basically vindicated all of the main points that the truck didn't work, that Milton was a loose cannon, that they couldn't shut him down. The legal counsel, the other executives all said they'd been trying to stop him from talking about this stuff. So they all threw him under the bus. And so he was fired. So I, I, think, I, down. I think I've got the continuation of this clip. And I think it's just worth showing because it shows the stock ticker and <laughs> how much each each uh, each is losing. So let's see if we get better audio here. Hydrogen fuel cell pickup mm, truck by better. the end of 2020. Check out GM shares, which, <laughs> by the way, were up pretty significantly on the news that it had taken the stake in Nikola. They're down by about 3.8 percent this morning. So GM Weird, went down uh, like four we'll percent. Nikola goes but down 30 percent. Hindenburg. Looks somewhat vindicated. Sorkin, if someone, and guys, if someone says, uh, somewhat vindicated. I don't want to make this about me. Somewhat. I want it to be about the company. <laughs> what we weren't making it, what the people were making it about Milton. They're making it about the company. I mean, either either they got a proprietary yeah. technology or, or not. I mean, does that, doesn't that sound like obfuscation? Kind of, I don't know. We'll see what finally comes out <laughs> yeah. from all of this. Right. That it's is fraud. like a faith it's crisis yeah, for dollars. business people. Yeah, exactly. That at this point, I might get the hell out of there too, especially if, uh, <laughs> You know, if if some of it has been hyped a little, I think Phil. We need to talk to Phil about a lot. Of, and there's some also Daimler and some others. I know we're replacing stuff. Well no, that's fine. That are, that are, you know, this is not Tesla. If you paint it, or maybe it is, but I'm saying that. that but to portray it like, you know, uh, like they've got a barrier to entry, like Tesla has for some other places. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> beginning of the beginning of, of what we look at, but. And then we had Mary Barr on. What do you think of that? I mean, how much due diligence well, I, was I GM? Wonder, 
That's the GM exec, right? Yeah, right. I wonder whether How his leaving has something to do with GM being yeah, unhappy yeah. about the, the situation and the fact that Gursky, oh, who helped sure. put that deal together, yeah. is now running the company. Right. <laughs> These people are yeah. shocked. Right. They really right, are. So just, uh, I, I, I would agree 100%. So, like, that that's literally like the business equivalent of people in faith crisis, right? Yeah, it is. Right? Yeah. They're like, they can't believe their ears. Their their beloved guy, their CEO that they thought was so great is, turn, is turning out to be a big sham. The whole thing was a sham. And the company then so, – so the fallout, there are several things that came from that. And I – by the way, there's a lot more to this story that is just a lot of detail that I'm trying to not – bog us down on and you can read the report you can listen to the podcast that gets into a lot of the personal stories about how this impacted our clients at this point no one knew who my clients were other than hindenburg but they didn't know that i was associated with hindenburg either so eventually that all came out through the podcast and through the court the he was indicted by the department of justice in the southern district of, of new york um trevor uh then went to trial uh, i think it was a about six months ago, I'm trying to remember the dates. Um, he was convicted on four counts. You played that uh, that clip a bit ago, um, and four of five counts. I was at the trial. Uh, my client Paul was the first witness. Um, the lawyers actually called me out, you know, as if I'm some evil person. It was very fun. Um, <laughs> the The courtroom was packed. It was there were people all around with cameras. It was actually kind of a fun thing to be part of that. Um, down in New York uh, for a, about a week. The trial went on for two months, though. He was ultimately convicted, and then just yesterday he was sentenced to four years, a million dollars fine, um, and restitution to be determined. So that's a big deal. The company sued him. Uh, they won that case. I think it's a $130 million verdict against him in an arbitration. And now the SEC also has a case against him, um, and they the company settled the case with the SEC. Uh, Trevor Milton has not yet resolved that case. The pressure. And that's going to start up now. What the SEC does in these criminal cases is they back off and they wait for the criminal case to finish, and then they start their case. So there's going to be fines and penalties. I mean, this guy is is um, toast. You know, I mean, he's got no credibility. I don't know what he'll do. Uh, but he still has a lot of stock. Um, he still has, as far as I know, a few planes. He's still a very wealthy guy um, and is continuing to live this extravagant lifestyle. Um, I, my understanding is during the, someone told me this, I don't know who, but that his he put up his whole family in the four seasons during the trial the whole time for two months. I mean, it was- For it, two months? Yeah, yeah. His whole family? Ridiculously. He just spends money like nobody's business, well, from what I've heard. Because he's about to be in prison forever. Yeah. And- or at least for four years. Well, and he's gonna, but he's gonna appeal it and try to delay it. So the judge did not put him in prison during the pendency of the appeal. So he's gonna be out for a while, and who knows if he'll disappear. If he tries to disappear, then they're gonna put him in jail. That's what happened to Elizabeth Holmes, is they found out that she was trying to leave the country while she was on bail and they pulled her back and then the judge incarcerated her as soon as the verdict came out. And unfortunately he can't get pregnant like Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, was able yeah to that was a good one. Well, but this this brings me to um, the sentencing. So- uh, I mean, we still have to talk about the abuse. No, we're not there yet. Okay, uh, okay. Let me, do, let okay, me go okay. back a little okay. bit. Cause so the sentencing, well, let me, t let me tell the sentencing cause it has a good, uh, some good aspects and then we can talk about what happened after it blew up kind of the, um, same thing that happened because there's still a Sean Reyes connection that we got to talk and about and the Tim Ballard connection, right? Both. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, but I wanted to just say that, um, in advance of the sentencing yesterday, uh, Milton's lawyers filed a bunch of um, uh, paperwork to say what a wonderful guy he was. And without getting into all of it, you can find it, it's online. Um, one of the things they said was they wanted to talk about how charitable he was, and they said to him. And they said, well, he paid um, his church tithing regularly. Someone asked in the chat, is he paying tithing? And the answer is yes, as far as we can tell. He gave the church stock instead of cash. <laughs> he gave them, I believe, 26 million shares of stock in the company, which the church then sold for a, 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 what we understand to be a significant uh, profit even over that. So the stock went up. The church doesn't hold stock anymore. They sell it and they made a lot of money on the stock that he gave them. And then they also talked about <clears throat> how he had spent two years 
you know, serving people in Brazil on his LDS mission as if he was a super charitable guy. I personally don't see that as charity, but you know, whatever. By the way, the church would have sold that loser on to other people, right? When they right. resold the oh, stuff. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Someone else would have bought it, and it would Some have. Some sucker been would tanked. have bought it from mm -hmm. the church. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually, it's usually through the market, though. Um, <laughs> I I, I want to. So I have uh, kind of a semi transcript of what Trevor Milton told the judge when he before he got sentenced. And it's the problem is I don't have the full transcript. This is like a Twitter feed. There was a guy live tweeting it, um, but he did say. A few things. Um, uh, he was sobbing. Uh, I feel terrible for everyone involved. I had amazing parents. I'd like to give you detailed examples of who I really am. This is Trevor Milton. Me yes. Do we know if there's video or audio of him? No. Do so federal court doesn't allow okay. video. Okay. There will be a transcript at some point, but it's it takes a while to get Bummer. those. So okay. what right. I have is a limited transcript <laughs> that was done by a guy um, who was there at the hearing. Okay. Keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's all right. Um, so, so you can start over if you want. I ask you to open your heart. He's talking to the judge. Uh, the Bible says God looks at the heart. Please listen to the end before deciding. As I reflect on my heritage, he pulls out a box of tissues. Sorry, Your Honor. I've never had to talk about these things before. I am one quarter Cherokee. There was ethnic cleansing against my ancestors. By the way, the judge is Hispanic, so I think he's... Anyway, I don't know. Plus, isn't Trevor super white? Very. Yeah. My people were driven into Oklahoma. The trauma <laughs> is visible on reservations. My people. The, the <laughs> generational trauma ended with my mother. She refused to pass it down to her children. From the time I was young, I had an unusually tender heart. In third grade, I saw where the red fern grows. <laughs> I cried. This is true. I am not making this up, people. I cried, and others laughed at me. I knew I would never be understood. Then my mother got sick. There was morphine for cancer. The doctors removed my mother's breasts. She was bald. My father sold our homes. Our garage was empty. Contrary to the hundreds of articles by the fake media, I was not entitled. There are some moments I've never even told my family about. My mother told me how beautiful heaven is. She'd visited. So she had a near-death experience. The yeah, like, yeah, yeah, on brand. There we go. That's very on brand. My mother said there are <laughs> colors in heaven that don't exist on earth. Your purity is broadcast in colors for the first time in my life. This is in court, people. This is not like him rambling. This is in court, in federal court in New York. He's saying this stuff. Um, let's see. For... Excuse me, for the first time in your life, you have you are reviewed totally in heaven, I guess. Those who sought destruction were filth. The process of repentance can take thousands of years on the other side. It is called hell. Each decision is broadcast to billions of God's creations. Our ability to absorb information is almost infinite. From that point on, I remember everything. <laughs> I, I actually don't know what he's talking about, but this was what he was trying to tell the judge. Um, then he talks about, uh, anyway, there, that there's lots of innocent people in prison, kind of insinuating, I think, that he was uh, uh, innocent. He was framed. Let's see. Ruben Carter, one of the greatest African-American boxers, was framed. He was found guilty by a jury, too. In 1995, black and Latino teenagers were convicted right here in New York City. Those reputations were destroyed. Then DNA exonerated them. So he's talking about the, the Central Park Five, I think. There is an estimated 20,000 innocent people in prison today. So he goes on and on. Then he talks about how his arm almost got cut off by a glass door. Um, <laughs> and then he goes straight to the judge's Hispanic character. No more could I strip your honor's heritage from you than you could fill Ill, find ill in my heart. I had no tutors. While others played polo, I went to the favelas. What is that? That's like the, the slums in the Brazil. Slums. Okay, there yeah. you go. Well, he wasn't playing polo because <laughs> that was the option. Go on a mission, <laughs> play polo. Uh, but I have compassion. This is my oh. calling in er on earth. It is difficult to get into heaven. I did not commit these crimes. It is impossible for me to purposely hurt others to take what is not mine. Then he goes on and on about his mission. Uh, I chose to do what was right. I saved millions after I paid taxes. I gave back. I started Nicola because this is the guy that says I don't give a shit about the environment, by the way. Here's what he said. I started Nicola because I wanted to leave this earth cleaner than I found it. I single-handedly charged the ve changed the vehicle industry. Mm -hmm. Hence why I always spoke in the present tense. I funded the company when no one else would. Mm. I took out hard money loans. 
I was not a very seasoned CEO. And then he goes on about his family. And um, anyway, <sighs> anyway, and then at the end he says, let me stay with my wife, your honor. And cause his wife's had some, some real um, medical problems. So anyway. So like he thinks he's not gonna go to prison for all this? I, I, I think he was just pleading for bail. <laughs> he didn't want to get a sentence. Cause he knows that this, I mean, his lawyers I'm sure have told him that it's gonna be very hard for him to get this reversed on appeal. So he's trying to get the smallest sentence he can. The problem with, from my perspective is four years isn't a ton. And if he walks away with a hundred million dollars in cash or stock, then how is that punishing this guy? I, you know, I mean, if you could have a hundred million, would you go to prison for, for four years? I don't know. Maybe. Or 600 million. Like 600 how much million. Do, do we know how much he has? We don't know. Exactly. Yeah. We know he has a lot of stock and we know he's got a lot of legal uh, problems now and he's probably going to eat it. Most of it will get eaten up. Uh, but yeah, he's. Could he have offshore accounts he and could. hidden money? Yeah. He's yeah. got $32 million ranch that the government is trying to seize. Um, he's got this other one in Woodland. Uh, he's got lots of assets. He's got this place in the Turks and Caicos. He's got some nice stuff. And if he just goes for four years, federal penitentiary is not so bad. It's, you know, who knows? Maybe he'll, maybe he'll be fine. Would he be like in a white collar prison? Maybe yeah, it would be will. different than a very much so. Yeah. 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 So just, and I guess crime I, pays, John. I, I sometimes yeah. white collar, white collar crime can pay. Yes. Um, and again, it's mind blowing that he hurts so many more people and yet he gets a lighter sentence than Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah. It's crazy. He didn't ever have a public company. Yeah. I think it's crazy to me too, but you know, I mean, what was the judge thinking? Like, did know. he buy the sob story? Like, I don't know. Yeah, he I, went and, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, as if this all weren't enough, it actually gets worse. Yeah. So don't go away. Like it turns <laughs> out he also, after, all of this falls apart. People finally, well, feel, no, it turns out that during some of this, while some of this is going on, allegations of sexual abuse um, arose about yes. Trevor Milton. And that was before it all fell apart, right? No, no, well, I think the story <clears throat> was after, I think it was right after that these people start coming out of the woodwork, right okay. after he stepped down as okay, CEO. Okay, got it, got it. So he was exposed, and I, I, I hope I'm getting that timing right, but the you've got, I think, one of the articles. I'm about to play the clip, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, so it turns out, in addition to all of this fraud, he was also uh, accused of sexual harassment. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the clip of that really quick. Same as CNBC. The pressure today comes following a CNBC.com report involving two women who are accusing former Nicola chair Trevor Milton of sexual abuse. One incident dating back to 1999, the other one dating back to 2004. A representative for Trevor Milton denies the allegations, telling CNBC, Mr. Milton strongly denies these false allegations. At no point in his life has Mr. Milton ever engaged in any inappropriate physical contact with anyone. And again, that's a spokesperson for Trevor Milton. All of this happens separately while we are looking at General Motors and wondering, will the GM deal close? Remember, GM is scheduled to take an 11% stake in Nikola. The close date was announced as September 30th. Oh, General so Motors has not said whether so or not be this before. is going to close by the yeah. 30th. A statement from the company saying our transaction with Nikola has not closed. We are continuing our discussions with Nikola and will provide further updates when appropriate or required. So we'll be watching this over the next couple of days. And all of this raises questions about former GM Vice Chair Steve Gursky, who is now the chairman of Nikola. And oh, he was one of the after. instrumental players it's in after. putting yeah, together down the Nikola point. SPAC IPO and then guiding the company through its agreement with General Motors. We have reached out to Nikola. We have not heard <laughs> any comment from the company regarding the status of its uh, discussions with General Motors. But no doubt, David, this is going to be one of those stocks that people are going to be focused on to see if does GM go through with the deal? Do they change the terms? Perhaps make it a little bit more favorable? Maybe it's after General the deal Motors was announced, but before Nicola. finalized. Maybe. A lot of questions. There. But if Gursky was running the company, that means by that point, hey, John, Trevor you know, had already stepped down. Some reporting that's been done uh, around the due diligence that uh, GM did yeah. sort of suggests that GM went in, uh, found that their technology, GM's technology, was actually in right. some cases superior, but that it was Nikola that had access to the capital that was going to be necessary to get this broader effort off the ground. Does that sort of match your understanding? 
That's my understanding as well. And what's interesting about that, Carl, if you think about it, from General Motors' perspective, the 11% stake in Nikola, that was the flyer here. That was going to be the, the element of this deal that could pay off. Yes, getting size and scale for both the Altium electric vehicle battery technology as well as providing hydrogen fuel cells to the semi that Nikola is developing, those were important elements of this as well. But keep in mind, GM did not put any money out on this. So if this deal falls apart, if GM decides to walk away, they're not out anything, aside from obviously the reputational hit that they'll take for people who will say, look, you should have done better due diligence to yes. realize everything that was involved with Nikola. By the way, they don't mention anything about sexual abuse. No. They just only talk about the business ramifications. Yeah. And I don't know, is there some difference between when the deal was announced and when it was finalized and when, when he was ousted? Because clearly... When that GM exec was appearing on CNBC with Trevor Milton. That was before. That had to have been before two, the sexual. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks before. Yeah. Okay. So I, in, 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 in hopefully we have all this timeline right. But the point is that at some point, I think that the sexual uh, issues came out after Trevor had already stepped down. That's my recollection. Because me. I remember being surprised. Um, and these both of these girls, they didn't say it in that report, John, but both of the girls were... Um, who've come forward were 15 when they say he sexually assaulted them. I have no knowledge one way or the other about those allegations. They are what they are. But that was uh, quite um, shocking to have that come out. Yeah, yeah. And then there was this next one. That yeah. Yeah, and then if that weren't bad enough, it's it gets worse because it turns out that there was at least one former associate who tried to be a whistleblower mm -hmm. to Utah's attorney general, Sean Reyes. Uh, well, initially to Holiday City, I think it was. Okay, yeah. So he came, he, he tried Which to where I live. <laughs> report, yeah, he tried to report s some of this inappropriate sexual uh, uh, activity that he claimed he knew of and he had text messages about it. He was gonna report that to Holiday City. Um, and then I guess there was some allegation by Trevor that he was trying to blackmail him. And then all of a sudden, this is kind of crazy because this, in my experience, doesn't happen very often. All of a sudden, this guy gets arrested, not by Holiday City where he was talking to, but rather by the state. The attorney general somehow reached into Holiday City, Sean Reyes, who we believe is a friend of Trevor Milton's. He certainly runs in the same circles. Um, he reached in, took over the case somehow, and then put this guy, his name is Johnny Robb, R-O-B-B. He was put in jail um, in in somewhere in Salt Lake City and then ended up committing suicide. Yeah, dying by suicide. And we're going to show that clip right now. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, a trigger warning uh, discussion of s s completion of, uh, of suicidality, heartbreaking story. Um, and it, it doesn't just reinforce, I guess, how awful Trevor Milton appears to be, but just how corrupt Utah's attorney, attorney general's office and or Sean Reyes appear to be if these allegations, along with the Tim Ballard OUR allegations, um, prove true. So I want to be careful. Yeah, I, I want to, I'm not. You know, you could, you could, you need to be careful about this. None of these are proven. It yeah, is very I'm unusual. Allegations. Right, right, right. I'm just because I'm a lawyer. I always yeah. want to be careful about this stuff. But they are allegations. But it's very unusual for me for the state to reach into a city case, pull jurisdiction out, and then put someone in prison. Not the one, by the way, who is the sexual assault -er, the one that is accused is Trevor Milton. But for some reason, the attorney general puts the accuser. Uh, uh, this Johnny Rob guy in in jail. Why? Why did that happen? Why did they take the case over in the first place? It's yeah. very odd. And then it's gonna you're gonna note that it talks about Trevor Milton donating to Sean Reyes's political reelection fund. It's a coincidence, John. Well, we'll see. Yeah, maybe. All right, let's go ahead and roll the tape. This is sad. Had a rich social life, and even though he did not come from money, he also made rich friends. He had mentioned he had a friend that was starting up a company, and this is Johnny. It had Rob. to do something with electric trucks. Trevor Milton, the founder of Nikola Motor Company, is a billionaire. In 2019, he set a real estate record, purchasing the most expensive home in Utah. I remember Johnny said one day, I'm sure he'll be really wealthy. But according to Johnny, as the two spent plenty of time and trips together, he started to learn how Trevor treated women. 
I definitely opened up to him about a lot of things. Nothing that I've ever worried would, would come back and yeah. uh, would, would be anything criminal. Johnny told police Trevor's behavior was worse than he describes. And as their friendship became more distant, Johnny says the things he knew aided him. Dude, I've hung on to every single Johnny dirty Rob. criminal secret with women that you've ever f***ing done, dude. You've got like thousands of skeletons in your closet, and these skeletons want justice. I'm bringing it all out, dude. The truth. All of it. Every little bit of it now. First, Johnny threatened to post screenshots of inappropriate messages Trevor sent to women. Then he accused Trevor of sexual assault and trying to pay women to have sex while he watched. Well, the worst thing I ever did in my, in, in my life was tell these girls to go hook up with other guys. Eventually, Johnny and Trevor started exchanging messages on Instagram. And then Trevor reported Johnny to the police, accusing his former friend of blackmail. He was asking for half a million dollars. Just so we're on the same page is that, that for this to, to work, you've got to be totally upfront about your relationships, about um, anything that he might have on you. We, we do need to know that, okay? And I never offered these girls to hook up with me, not once. Even though Trevor originally reported Johnny to the Summit County Sheriff's Office, the Utah Attorney General oh, took County. over the case. Park City, right? On April 16th, 2020, Jonathan Howard Robb was arrested in Murray for extortion in a sting operation set up by special agents. Wait till you read what he's done to women, bro. It's justice, dude. According to these recordings from the Utah Attorney General's office, when Johnny spoke to them, he argued the money was Trevor's idea, a deal to prevent him from releasing more damaging information. He described the $500,000 as a settlement not blackmail. I just have a bank full of this stuff, and he knows it. How are we supposed to believe that that's true? Uh, you got my phone? You go grab my phone. We'll pull it all up. Just hang on to it. Okay, just hang, hang on. Hang on to it. Let this all blow over. Once this is all blown over, do whatever in the hell you want with it. Special agents declined Johnny's invitation to look through the messages together on his phone. He spent the next 20 days in jail. I'm going to win this thing. And I'm just suffering here until we can get this show on the road. When I asked him, why did you do this? He, he said, Dad, you don't know how bad of a person, how many people he's hurt. I said, but this isn't how you do it. I've taught you differently. The day after his release, Johnny died by suicide. I thought, OK, well, he's going to let us help him get the help he needs. And we didn't get that opportunity. Two months later, Trevor Milton made his first ever contribution to the re-election campaign of Attorney General Sean Reyes, $15,000, leaving Johnny's friends and family asking why the AG's office took over the case. When we asked about the sexual assault allegations, a spokesperson for the agency said our interest was the extortion case, period. It makes us want to know, was there more to the story than, than what we were provided? We first informed the Attorney General's office we had questions about the case on September 24th, 2020. The next day, Sean Reyes's campaign refunded the $15,000 donation. Quote, given the current allegations, and although at this point they are only allegations, we felt it best to return the recent donations. It feels really vulnerable talking about it. Since Johnny's death, three women, including Trevor Milton's cousin, have accused Trevor of sexual assault. This photo is from when they were children. He goes, well, yeah, I'm in um, a class. It's a massage class. And everybody takes off their shirt during massage. Aubrey Smith says she was 15 years old. Trevor was 17. And then he goes, yeah, in my class, the, the girls always take their bras off because the straps get in the way. And I froze. And as he said it, he undid my bra and took it off. And he groped me, and somebody eventually knocked on the door. The statute of limitations in her case has run out, but investigators still documented their findings in a police report. I never worked for him another day, and I went home ashamed. Allison was also 15 years old when she worked for Trevor in St. George and says she was assaulted. She asked us to not show her face or full name, for privacy reasons. He was my boss, he was my right home. He was, I was much smaller than him. 
uh, I just wanted to go home. He knew he had done it. He had bragged to other people, and that's how my story came out. He was trying to glamorize the situation, make it sound like it was hot. Tyler Winona, another former friend of Trevor Milton, says he views his experience as very similar to Johnny Robb. He was interviewed by St. George PD, but Milton has never been charged. I wish the prosecutors and police would, would take these things a little more serious. As more allegations came in, Trevor Milton stepped down as chairman of Nikola Motors. He was also dealing with a fraud investigation involving his company, in which a jury eventually found him guilty. More needs to be done to hold Trevor accountable. Aubrey said she never heard of Johnny Robb until after sharing her story. She still wants to know why the attorney general's office treated Trevor Milton as a victim, not a suspect. They have a responsibility to look into it deeply and to give weight to what Johnny was saying. It, it's heartbreaking for me because I think he was really brave. Before his arrest, we spent several months in contact with Trevor Milton's PR team. At the time, he simply said, quote, I intend to defend myself against false allegations leveled against me by outside detractors. Live in studio tonight, Adam Herbetz, Fox 13 News, Utah. The, the, the Salt Lake Tribune, I think, was uh, accepting nominations for like Utah of the year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't Adam Herbert's be? In, in, <laughs> yeah. That guy is everywhere. He's done a great he's, job. He's over Sean Reyes, you know, Tim Ballard, OUR. He's just Johnny on the spot. And mm -hmm. I just want to give a per. I don't know if he'll hear this. I hope all of you will just email Adam Herbert's and say, Thank you, Adam, for the reporting, the, the investigative journalism you do for Utah. Yeah. Tell him John Dillon gave me a huge shout out on Mormon Stories because that dude is a hero yeah. as far as journalism goes in Utah. Well, and I, I want to say one other thing, and that is, you know, we talked about this a little earlier, John, but, you know, these, I'm just looking at the chatting and people are saying, why didn't these girls come forward sooner? And, you know, this is a powerful guy. He is well known. He's now a, a billionaire. He has been a billionaire until recently. And it is very scary thing to, to take on wealthy, powerful people. You look at what Epstein, uh, Jeffrey Epstein got away with for all those years, year after year, even after he was a sexual, you know, like a sex offender, registered sex offender, he still was getting women brought to him in different ways and he was assaulting them. It's powerful people are intimidating and I, I feel for those victims and I'm sorry this happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's different ways we could kind of wrap this up. But the one question I think that is maybe the most important question for Mormon Stories podcast is in, in your, you know, you've been you've been investigating and whistleblowing um, Mormon related affinity fraud and fraud for decades now. Yeah, I would say you're the world's number one guy for Utah related. <laughs> the world's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I affinity fraud in Utah. Come on. I don't know. I just like to help people. I mean, being but, a lawyer is not very rewarding sometimes, but I get a lot of, you, you like uh, it. I get a lot of satisfaction out of helping people. Well, the point, the question I wanted to ask is to what extent is this a Mormon story? And is yeah. this a Mormon phenomena? If you can just free form, I didn't ask you to prepare for this. What are the doctrinal, historical, theological, cultural, legislative factors that are Mormon hmm. that allowed this story and that allow so much affinity fraud, apparent a, a attorney general, abuse of power, uh, you know, unhealthy MLMs? What is it about Mormon culture, history, doctrine, theology, practice, legislature, et cetera, that, that enables all this? Uh, <laughs> is, that a, a is, that a two minute, is that a one minute question? No, that's a, a five podcast. That's a whole other podcast. Uh, we did a podcast and, and it's interesting. We did it some years ago and I, it, it, I think it was called affinity fraud or something. I can't remember, but we, 
I've, my thinking has evolved about it since then, and I think there's a number of factors. I'll just go through them quickly. One of them is the church is not vocal enough. I have called out the church, and I'll do it right now again. The LDS church should have excuse me, records, letters read over the pulpit in general conference and in the wards saying that just because someone is going to church with you doesn't mean you should invest with them, that you should verify investments, not just trust. That's a problem. Other, in terms of LDS theology, the Mormon church absolutely has a, a, a prosperity gospel going on. I mean, there's no question in my mind, having spent 45 years in the church, um, uh, that the church emphasizes, culturally at least, that if you're righteous, you will be successful in life. And so people... Uh, it, feel like the wealth and having nice cars and having nice houses is somehow some sort of manifestation of their righteousness, which is ridiculous, by the way. Um, there's another one I want to talk about, which I haven't really talked about um, much, and that is the the gift of discernment. Uh, and this is something that I think is really problematic in the church. We, You've talked about it with respect to um, sex abusers, and one of the reasons I think the church doesn't acknowledge the extent of sex abuse in the church is because, especially when it comes to leaders, they're put into being the scoutmaster or the bishop or the young men's president or whatever, purportedly by by inspiration. And so if the church acknowledges that inspiration doesn't work, they can't do that, right? Well, that's problematic because then it enables these people to continue to abuse others, and that applies to investing as well. What happens in the investing world is that people are looking for money like Trevor did in the early days. Most all of his investments came from, or excuse me, his investors came from his ward or people he knew through his uh, relationships at church. And they <clears throat> didn't do a lot of research. They trusted Trevor. They thought he was a nice guy. They enjoyed him. Um, I've, I've told you this before, John, I've had cases where people were solicited for an investment in the, in the celestial room of the temple. I've had cases where we had a case once where a stake president was uh, defrauding like all the members of his stake. And of course, they all thought he was great because he was the stake president. Uh, I had another case where uh, the financial clerk defrauded people in the ward because he knew that people had information. He had the information about their tithing receipts. So he solicited investments from the people he knew had the most money in the ward. So this church has a problem with fraud. And Culturally, it's complicated. I think it is going to depend. You know, did Trevor Milton become who he was? Which is, I believe, uh, my personal view is that he's a he's a com compulsive liar. I mean, he really cannot tell the truth, and he's done that his whole life. Is that church? Can you blame the church for that? I don't know. Maybe he lied about you know whether he touched himself to his bishop, and it started from there. I don't know, but but there is something about that. There's something about the end justifies the means, and there's something about the prosperity gospel. And then people who trust someone because they go to church with them and think that they must, they're a good person. Therefore, the investment that they're soliciting or the loan is 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 a good investment. And so that's the stuff I keep trying to stop. That's the thing I try to talk about to people. And I would encourage anyone who hears this to please talk to your parents um, and, you know, explain to them if they have some weird investment that play, pays 10% a month or 20% a year or something that sounds too good to be true, please just talk them out of it. Help them learn that this is not safe and that those kind of returns are not real because what's happening is people, there are there are wolves in sheep's clothing throughout congregations all across the Wasatch Front, and that needs to be combated somehow. The church is not willing to combat that. So how do we do it? And I don't know the answer other than talking about you it. You would think it would be the Mormon church's, to the Mormon church's benefit to not have Utah be the scammy fraud capital of the planet, and that they would not want this all this bad PR. So well, like, I wonder why they wouldn't shut it all down. One after another, and they all run together. I mean, we have a picture here of... Um, I'm going to show this right now. Yeah. So here's the picture. Tell people what they're seeing here. This this is uh, uh, this is a picture of... Who, of who's the, Aaron Wags, first of all? Aaron Wagner is a kind of a, a bro. I mean, I don't know him. I, I uh, We found this on uh, his social media accounts. It's out there for anyone to see. He's a, he was part of a group that did, I think, something called AlphaCon last year. It was hilariously Utah, where they brought some 
guys with flat brimmed hats to come and talk about how good of businessmen they are and how you can be like them and you just have to pay money. Um, so Aaron Wagner owns a bunch of restaurants in town, uh, Dirty Birds I think he owns and he owns some other, uh, Las Boteas is, I think he's an investor or an owner of that. So he's an influential guy, but he runs in these same circles. I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying there's anything about Aaron Wagner other than he runs in these circles. I don't know. I'm, I'm not aware of anything that he does that's illegal or fraudulent. I just want to put that out there. But this picture is interesting because it shows uh, Trevor Milton. So wait, Trevor <clears throat> Milton's on the left. Yeah, on the left. Um, and then, then for right, those who are listening, who else is in the picture? Well, right next to him is Aaron Wagner. No, no, no. Right next to him is Tim Ballard, right? Oh, Tim, I'm Tim Ballard. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Tim Ballard. And then there's a guy next to them. And these, these, these all have girlfriends with them. Next to him is... A guy named Jimmy Rex. I don't yeah, know and if I'm you friends know. with Jimmy. I've been on Jimmy's podcast. Okay, so that's Jimmy Rex next, yeah. right? And then I think next is a guy, I think that's Heavy D, uh, the Diesel Brothers. I believe that's who that is. Um, and then on the far right is Aaron Wagner. And the only dude missing from that is freaking Sean Reyes. Yeah, he's, he probably took the picture. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these guys all run together. I mean, I don't know how they all know each other. I know they all drive exotic cars, and I think that there is a... Uh, exotic car culture in Salt Lake where a lot of these guys get to know each other. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, again, I, I want, I want Utah to do well. I want the Mormon church to just be a healthy, happy place. I, I, I want these people and their families. I have, I have no ill will towards Jimmy or even freaking Tim or Trevor, huh? but there's something in the water, dude. There's something in the Utah know. bro yeah. tech culture water along with all the prepper apocalyptic yeah. NDE visions of glory stuff, we've got some cultural sickness. And you, you forgot crypto. We have a lot of crypto going on right now. Um, several of them have been sued by the SEC. Um, one called Nerds, uh, another one called, uh, or no, Green, excuse me, Green. Another one uh, recently was uh, Nerds, I, think, I guess it was. But anyway, there's some of those that are being shut down now, but there's a whole crypto culture also that I think is problematic. That's yeah. a whole nother day. Yeah. Well, again, uh, you know, I, I do want to just make a, a final clarification that people are innocent until proven guilty. It looks like Trevor Milton was proven guilty, at least for um, the fraud stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong about Sean Reyes, just allegations, um, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, sometimes people do falsely accuse. And so... Yeah. That's why I love the law, right? And that's <laughs> well, why I love evidence, and that's SEC why I love facts. The doesn't get it right all the time. The yeah. DOJ doesn't get it right all the time, that's for sure. And allegations are allegations, and the little the legal process will work through its, its, its process. And I really have nothing to do with that. All I know is that people need to think about where they put their hard-earned money. That's, that's, they need to be very careful who you give your money to. But also there's a... There, th there's a, a criminal justice problem potentially in Utah, whether it's the the multiple reports against Ruby Frankie and the eight mm -hmm. passengers family, the the multiple reports against Jody Hildebrandt, who was the therapist to the Frankies, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the allegations against Tim Ballard and how Sean Reyes apparently allegedly shut all that down to protect Tim Ballard and OUR. And with this Trevor Milton stuff, it's like where is the law enforcement, where's the judicial process to stop this stuff early? And why is it that the the money and the people in power and even apparently law enforcement officers sometimes and even the attorney general's office allegedly are defending the perpetrators and sometimes even prosecuting or punishing the victims, like there's a, is it there a criminal justice problem maybe in Utah yeah, that needs know. to be looked at? I mean, I think these, a lot of these state agencies don't get the funding they should. The The Utah Division of Securities is like the SEC on the state level. They don't have the funding they need. Um, I know that uh, Sean Reyes is, you know, he came into office pledging that financial fraud was one of his highest priorities. And I think that they've done a decent job taking these folks down. Um, but apparently if you're a, a campaign contributor, then that doesn't apply. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Nicola, like Trevor Milton donated after well, Sean yeah. Reyes hooked him up. Which is interesting. 
<laughs> yeah. But you're saying Sean Ray, okay, just to give credit where credit is due, you're saying Sean Ray did well, he's, make some progress I mean, on fraud? His folks, he's got folks that prosecute uh, securities fraud in Utah. Yeah, that the Division of Securities has Attorney General's office people who, who prosecute those. And there have been good, good cases that they've brought to shut down. Um, I, I, uh, we had another situation. One of my cases involves the Kingston clan that, that you recently interviewed, um, one of the women from, and they have been, you know, indicted and imprisoned for, uh, uh, fraud on the U S government. That was pretty significant. Well, it turned out that they'd given, I think $35,000 to the attorney general. So, um, and Sean, Sean Reyes. Yeah. 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 So if you want, I mean, what. What that implies, and I'm not saying this is true, is if you want to get out of crimes in Utah, donate to Sean Reyes and the Attorney General's office. Now, again, I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's what these dots seem to suggest if you connect them. People could come to that conclusion, but the problem is this is the third Attorney General in a row that has stepped down in, in disgrace or in controversy at least. And he hasn't stepped down. He's just saying he won't run well, for re-election. Right. He's right? not running yeah. for re-election, but he's yeah. not running for Senate, presumably, and he was going to. Yeah. So maybe he'll run for governor. I don't know. But, but you know, Sean is a political guy. He wants to keep running for office, I'm sure. Um, I'm not sure who would hire him in these days. I'm, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up. Well, Utah Mormon Church, Governor Cox, like Utah legislature, clean up your fraud pro problem. Mm. Uh, clean up your attorney general's office, please. Yeah. We hope the next one will be honorable. Yeah. All right. Well, any any we've said a lot. We're two <laughs> two and a half hours in. Sorry. That's actually short for Mormon story oh, standards. Oh. So we're like this is just like You're an welcome. infomercial, basically, yeah. <laughs> or like a like a yeah a blurb. This is almost a TikTok for Mormon story standards. <laughs> any final words you want to yeah, offer? Yeah, I I I I just want to say you know John, you and I have known each other for a long time. Um, I and I wanted to thank you for all you've done for this community. Um, many people. Uh, I left the church, I think, 12 years ago, um, and we've known each other, I think, much of that time. And and I've seen how you've evolved and you've grown, and I'm just uh, really grateful on behalf of all your listeners uh, for what you've done to help people transition out of the church because it's hard. Um, and to those who I know who listen to these, and I don't know, it's way off topic, but I just want to say um how great it is to leave the church <laughs> i just want to pitch it like all you people that are faking it in the church and pretending that you believe and you really don't get out because guess what there's a whole world out there and i love it and i i've never been so happy in my life as since i left the church and all the horror stories and all the scary things people say are bullshit. it's actually great but isn't that like fake happiness? It's fake. Mark, isn't My that? happiness is purely fake. Because wickedness never was happiness. <laughs> you know that. Listen, John. You know that the great deceiver can, I know. can yeah. imitate I know. the true I know. spirit of goodness. Listen, I, I just want to tell you, I just we just celebrated my daughter's wedding in Italy uh, a few months ago. And all eight of my children, I have eight children, and all of them are out of the church. And we were all there dancing and celebrating. There was no temple anywhere for hundreds of miles, as far as I know. And it was Rome temple. so beautiful. Yeah, this was down in Amalfi. Oh, okay. It was okay. far okay. away. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, you it's just great. And there's a whole world. Uh, uh, Brooke, Brooke Lark, you know, one of my first podcasts I ever listened to you of yours was Brooke Lark. And she said something. Brooke McClay at the time. Yeah, Brooke McClay yeah. at the time. And, yeah. and Brooke said something that I'll never forget. And she said, um, there's a, the, what I didn't realize is I was living in a black and white world and now it's in technicolor and it's so great. And I just am 100% on board with that. All right. Well, uh, that's a beautiful testimony. Yeah, that's all I got for those who, uh, who might benefit from, from following your path, Mark. From, from us old timers who've, who've uh, <laughs> uh, paved the way. Really quickly, if someone wants to hire you, remind them how to get a hold of you and what type of work you oh, would be hired for. Sure. Um, and, and I, I just have to say this because last time we did this, I, I did get a lot of calls and I can't take every case. And I just want to say that right up front. I try to be careful what cases I take. We have four lawyers that do this full time. That's all we do, but we have to be pretty selective because these cases are very hard and they sometimes take eight to 10 years before you even get paid. So I don't take 
everyone, but I'm happy to chat with people about their situation. You can find me on our website, pugsleywood.com. Um, and you can or you Google my name, it'll come up. Um, and I'm always happy to chat with people, uh, especially people who are work inside big companies, especially publicly traded companies. If you work in a brokerage firm, if you work in some sort of big uh, trading firm and have knowledge of improper behavior, um, give me a call because those are the cases I particularly like. Uh, smaller, you know, $50,000 losses are sad, but I really can't take those cases, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Well, Mark, we hope you come back again on Mormon Stories. We love having you. All right. Thanks, our John. audience is thanking you for, okay. <laughs> uh, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. And I'll just say um, thanks for joining us. If you uh, enjoy these episodes, there's a couple things we could really use your help on. Please become a subscriber on YouTube. Uh, please like this episode and share it. And most importantly, we couldn't do this work without our donors. So if you're a monthly donor, thank you. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. If you value this content, you're not a monthly donor and you want to see it continue. We uh, lost a lot of donors in 2023 just because donors last about two years on average and then they stop donating because they move on or they fall on financial hard times or whatever the reason is they want to support something else. So we always need people to step up uh, and support this podcast to keep it going. So you can go to Mormon, mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and we'll keep trying to provide you with this content for as long as we can. Thanks to Julia for her work today, Brooklyn, Gerardo, uh, um, and uh, the Open Stories Foundation Board. Thanks to Maven for all she does. We've got a great staff, got a great board, and uh, we've got more good stuff in the days, weeks, and months ahead. I will say, we're breaking a really big story tomorrow. Uh, Chelsea Goodrich, um, who was uh, part of the AP story on the Mormon church buying victim silence and protecting abusers. We have Chelsea Goodrich on Mormon Stories podcast tomorrow. And then we're going to be sharing the three secret audio recordings that she recorded wow. of her negotiations with uh, Ridding, Paul Ridding. Of the uh, of the Mormon Church's risk management department, uh, I don't know for two or three decades, um, and then we're going to have uh, uh, an Idaho attorney. Um, uh, uh, come on, and uh, Colby Colby Reddish. We're going to have him come on and do some analysis of Idaho law. Mm. And, um, you know, and how poorly that was handled as a lawyer. <laughs> can I just say that story just makes me shudder that, that how poorly that whole situation was handled yeah. by that guy. So that's coming in the next few days. Merry Christmas. And we'll try and come up with some Mormon stories episode prior to Christmas so that we don't lead you into Christmas with, with, uh, a really important, but very heavy abuse story. So anyway, lots of cool stuff to come. Thanks for your support. Um, tune in again soon for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Clean up the Attorney General's office and uh, avoid fraudsters. Thanks, everybody. Y'all take care.